Okay, good morning. Welcome to the last day of LXMLS. I hope you have been enjoying this week, both uh, learning and having fun in Lisbon. I'm sure you have been trying to do both. So today, for the last uh, morning, we have the pleasure to have Adele Kuber with us. So Adele has been here the whole week, so I'm sure you all know her. She's been around every day since day one. So Adele is a, a postdoc at the Causal AI Lab at Columbia University with uh, Elias Barenboim, who was himself a student of Judea Pro. So she's in a very distinguished line of people in this area of causal inference. And causal inference is probably the most interesting thing that's happening nowadays in AI, at least from my perspective. So I'm very, I'm very happy to have Adele here today, and, and I'm sure you also are, and I'm very curious to know what she has to tell us and what she has to teach us. Okay, Adele, thank you for being here, and what is yours? Thank you. Uh, so thank you, uh, first, for all of you that are here. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be attending this school. Um, and I, I'm going to talk a little bit about the causal artificial intelligence, which allow us, uh, this is a program, this is a still ongoing uh, research field. And uh, the goal is to have a, a more explainable, generalizable and trustworthy decision making. Uh, so recently we have uh, a lot of breakthroughs in data science, artificial intelligence, machine learning. For example, uh, we have many systems, systems that are able to perform extremely well uh, predictions. You can have like high dimensional settings. Uh, uh, you can use many uh, deep learning networking uh, networks, a lot of these tools and these statistics and they can uh, achieve a really high accuracy. Uh, for uh, these predictive uh, tasks, for example, uh, pattern recognition, classification, um, for example, some, some, some fields, reinforcement learning, computer uh, vision, uh, natural process languages, a lot of you are uh, in this field. But, um, and th these are some examples. For example, we have now DeepMind uh, AI that uh, can be the best Go player in the world. We have uh, cars that are fully autonomous. We have systems, AI systems that are better than physicians, doctors at predicting some disease. Uh, some, we can also have robot, robots that can uh, uh, write news uh, that are almost in the human level. And uh, the question is that, are we done? Uh, is there anything else that we can do to improve these systems? Um, and the, the answer is, of course, yes. Uh, one, one, the, one challenge is about explainability. So many times we know uh, that the accuracy is high, the, 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 the algorithms are, are, are able to classify really well uh, or um, uh, predict a, a disease, for example, but we don't know what are the process inside of these programs. So we cannot reason about uh, uh, why this, this prediction is being made. Also, we don't know if the algorithm is, um, is, is designed in a way that, that is following the, 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 uh, what, what we expect as a fair society. So we, we, we expected some rules to be, to, uh, to be fair and not necessarily the algorithm is following those rules. And um, one thing that, uh, that's really hard is uh, about reasoning about causal and effects relationships. So this is what AI cannot do it. AI is still with struggles to grasp causal and effect relationships. And uh, how can we classify these challenges that we have today? So we have a lot of these data hungry sample inefficiency algorithms. So we need a lot of data to get this high uh, predicted power. We also, uh, have a lack of interpretability and explainability. As I said, so lack of robustness, sometimes generalizability. Sometimes you have data from one population, one domain, and sometimes you want to, exp uh, to, to predict this uh, in another, in a different environment. You want a, a out of distribution, uh, high accuracy as well. As I said, those are algor algorithms can be unfair or, or make some decisions that are unethical. And all of these this challenges, all these issues 
are coming from the fact that we have lack of causal inference capability. So how can we actually overcome these challenges with causality? So this is an essential component in the next generation of artificial intelligence, because first, we have language that allow us to do data fusion. And when I say data fusion, it's about combining different, uh, different di dimensions of the data. So we have uh, data that are coming from multiple heterogeneous domains, uh, multiple studies coming from experimental studies or observational studies, different populations, different sampling approach. And we want to understand how can we, act, we can uh, combine this data in a principal way. So this is called data fusion for us. Um, effect identifiability. So uh, that is a difference between prediction and, uh, 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 and the prediction of intervention. So prediction usually for us right now is just about um, uh, recognizing what's the best, uh, the, the best guess. So you, after observing some event, you want to guess what would be the, the, the most likely outcome. And this is different than uh, what would be the outcome of making an intervention. So if we are working with, uh, 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 if you're designing a policy, a public policy, you need to perform some intervention in the environment and then understand what would be the outcome. So it's different, you are making an action, you're not just observing and then guessing what would be the outcome. And this is what we do, we, we do in effect identifiability. So we want to determine the effect of an unrealized intervention. So this is really important because we don't want to perform the experiment. We want, we want to use data that are collected, that's collected in a passively way and estimate the effect as if we perform an intervention, a control randomized experiment. So this is exactly the, a, a, a distinguish, uh, we are trying to distinguish between an, a simple association, a simple statistical association and causation. There is a, 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 a delicate difference here that I'm going to try to explain over this uh, uh, tutorial. General disability. This is also uh, known as transportability in the field. And the idea is when you, even if you perform an experiment, so you run the, 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 the run, you run the experiment in some population could be a controlled environment, you are not certain if this is actually the same, the effect to be the same if you move to the real world or to another population, to another domain. And to, uh, to actually ex ex extrapolate this, uh, this inference, that is this field that's called transportability that I, I also uh, would like to uh, discuss a little bit today. And explainability. Explainability, why? Because we, we don't, we cannot just learn what, what's the best prediction? We want to understand what is, what is the reasoning that the algorithm is, it, it, uh, has inside to actually uh, uh, give us this prediction. So we want to understand the model behind it. We want to learn the model or at least uh, induce the, the, the training in a way that we will understand later why the, the, the outcome is, is coming about. And it, Fairness is just a, a, a particular uh, example uh, of explainability, of course. So if you know um, how the algorithm is, is, is deciding, uh, making some decision, you, you, you can um, evaluate direct relationships, indirect relationships, medi mediated relationships. So you can understand if the, if, if, if the mechanisms are being fair, if the, if the features that are being used are those that, uh, that are those that we uh, consider as fair uh, in a system. So uh, what's the goal of this field? This is a, a, a really new field. Uh, we call it causal data science. And the goal of this program is to develop language, criteria, and algorithms for first data fusion, as I said. So uh, we need to develop the language. Here, I, I'm going to use the language of graphical models. Uh, of course, you can you can uh, develop your own language, but as long you are being uh, 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 you, as long you are using principal approach uh, to to combine and understand the assumptions and why the, 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 the how the data was collected and how you combine all all this data. So uh, th this is fine. Uh, 
then we also want to do ca uh, causal inference. As I said, we don't want just to uh, learn associations, the statistical associations. We want to know what would be the outcome if we really perform an intervention in the environment. This is different. And this is related to decision making because you don't want just to guess, you want to perform some intervention. And then, as I said, public, public policy, we want to make a, a, a robust decision. And this has to be generalizable to any environment that you, are, uh, that you want to, uh, to, to apply uh, the system. And there is this paper uh, that, that's by Professor Elias Barimboy and Yudia uh, Pro. Uh, causal inference and data fusion problem. This paper covers, uh, it's a, a review of most of the, the topics that we are working right now. Uh, of course, not all the results are there, but I think this is a good start if you want to understand all the topics that, that are uh, uh, relevant right now in, 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 in science. And uh, that is this website, causalfusion.net. Um, this is a, a web application for uh, students, researchers, or, or any enthusiastic that wants to understand better causal, uh, causal inference. Uh, if you are from academia, you can uh, register using our email.edu or uh, any educational email, it works, uh, because this is, a, is still an internal application that we have in our lab, but this allows us to uh, uh, model uh, a causal diagram, then see if the effect is identifiable or not, to estimate the effect. So this, we are implementing most of the tools that we develop in the, in the lab in this application. So uh, I will try to show some screenshots. Maybe if I have time, we can open the, the, the software and I can even show you how to uh, 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 use it. But feel free to register and, and may, maybe ask me if you, if, you need, if you need to understand better how to use this system. So uh, let's start. Uh, causality theory by Uder Pro. This is the causality theory, in my opinion. There's no different causality fields. It's just that Uder Pro um, was the father uh, of, of this approach that's using graphical models. And this is. Uh, uh, all the theory, all the causality theory is, can be represented by the graphical language. So it's, it's a new way of rewriting the assumptions and to understand better the tools. So everything that we know, uh, uh, for example, from, from Rubin's approach, that's the potential outcome if you, if you know about it. So any type of causal uh, theory is covered by the Udea Pearl's causality theory. And, uh, and because this language allows us to uh, understand better the assumptions, we have many more developments now that are only on uh, the causal, uh, the graphical theory of causation. But if you want to learn a little bit about that, or uh, just to, to have a feeling, I would start with the, the book of why. This is a, a, a pro uh, uh, with Dana McKenzie. Uh, they, were, they wrote this book uh, to, uh, to be really accessible. So everyone, if you don't need to have any uh, knowledge about what is causality, like it's requiring a, a minimal uh, assumptions about your background. So you can really start this uh, understanding the theory by this book. And then uh, if you want to uh, now understand better the methods, I would recommend you to start reading this causal inference statistics. It's a really, really short book. You can read it maybe in one week. And then you will get a feeling about uh, uh, the basic theory behind it, the methods. And then there's the Bible. Uh, of course, you can, uh, if everyone that's researching on this field needs this book, I, uh, I check this book out almost every day. <laughs> it's impossible to read like in one, uh, one shot, but this is a, a really uh, a comprehensive book. And it doesn't cover uh, everything, but of course, this is a really important book. Um, as a, uh, this causal inference in, in statistics is the primer, uh, we also have a website that Causality 101. So if you're reading this book, you are starting this book, I also recommend you to access this website. It, it, it has all the examples in the book. So while you are reading it, you can try it by yourself and then you can check what would be the effect, what are the difference. 
So it's really helpful uh, for uh, teaching and uh, for a student also for learning. Uh, okay, so um, I will start with the mathematics a little bit. It's not too heavy, but uh, uh, we need to understand first what's a structure causal model. We call it SCM. Uh, so if I speak SCM, you know that I'm talking about structure causal model. And this is the, the, the model that we believe that generates the data. It's really fair to, to, to assume that this is this that exists is a model that's generating the data. And uh, if you know this model, you have fully explainability. There's uh, no discussion about that. And uh, what is this structural causal model or SCM? It's a tuple, basically. There are like four components. The first one is a set of variables V. We call it as endogenous variables because they are the variables that we really observe. So I'm not requiring you to observe all the relevant variables uh, for the system. This will be just the, the variables that you collect. It's a subset of the variables that are relevant. Uh, the other variables are called, we, we denote it as U. So these variables are the exogenous variables or latent variables or hidden variables. We have many names for them, but those are the, the variables that exist in this data generating module. So they are there, they are really important, but you, you didn't observe. Um, then we have a collection of functions uh, that, that are going to determine, determine each of these variables in the set V. So you observe these variables V and these variables V need to be a function of other variables that are either or in the set V or in the set U. So uh, it's a function of uh, the parents and the U uh, the use are the exogenous causes. So parents are causes for, for you. So if you know the model, of course, you know all the causes already. And then you understand this relationship between parents, parents are the causes and children are, are the effects. We have this par parental uh, or, or family relationships. And there is the probability of the exogenous variables that we call it PU. So those are the four components. And uh, that is one assumption here um, that uh, we are going to make, I, I believe is, is the first one. <laughs> it's important to know that we assume that this model is recursive, which means that there is no cyclic mechanism. So this is a limitation of the, the theory right now. Uh, if you really want to research on this field, I recommend you to try to extend this to cyclic mechanisms. But uh, there are also many, many open questions yet uh, assuming this uh, assumption, uh, making this assumption. So um, uh, of course it's not so strong. We, we, if, you, if you think about it, there's always a way of unroll the mechanism. So what is a cycle uh, depending on, so this is a philosophical question. So a cycle could be only something that you couldn't observe the, 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 the unrolled mechanism. So if you had like, a, a, a way to sample in a in a finer uh, uh, in a, a like the resolution of the sample is is higher. Like you would observe a time series data, and then you would observe this as an acyclic process. Uh, but uh, maybe in the end, this the the, the static uh, or the 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 stable uh, or the, the the system in equilibrium is actually a cyclic method. So this is a, an assumption. Um, okay, uh, I want to just uh, give this example just for you that uh, maybe already know what is a structure equation model or SEM. This is really uh, famous in statistics. So this is a, a one particular example of, of structure causal model where, uh, so we have a set of variables V, uh, the U's are the error terms of this model, the functions are usually linear. Uh, so it, uh, if you're working in structure equation modeling, you usually assume some, some parametric form of this uh, system. In this case, it's linear, couldn't, it could be not nonlinear. And the, the, the use, as I said, we need to, 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 to define what's the probability or the, the distribution of the variables, U, the exogenous variables. And sometimes we assume some structure for, in this case, it's linear for the covariance matrix. And you see that there are zeros in the, uh, uh, out of the diag di 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 diagonal. And this means that the arrows are independent of each other. 
Uh, so you see here that there are more assumptions that, 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 uh, that are required to fully specify this model. For example, they are linear functions, the distribution of the exogenous variables are, nor, nor, are Gaussian. Uh, the fact that the, the, the errors are all, all independent of each other is called uh, causal sufficiency. And this means that the, the system is Markovian, or this is under the Markovianity assumption, so we call it, it uh, with these names. Uh, but the, the, the lesson here is that if you are looking for a, a model, a fully specified model to explain your system, you are going to need, you need to uh, assume the parametric form of the function and the distribution of the errors. And sometimes even for estimation, you're going to make some other strong assumptions, for example, Markovianity. So this is just a particular case of a, of a structured causal model. And uh, uh, what is a causal diagram? A causal diagram, uh, so this is, well, let, let's just uh, pick an example. So this is another SCM. There are functions here. The, the point is like, usually we don't observe the structure causal model. And it's too strong to say that I need to learn the structure causal model. So I put it in gray because this is re representing something that exists, but we don't observe. And uh, however, that is this, a uh, uh, construction process that uh, allow us to uh, represent the same, the same system as a causal diagram. So we have here uh, this, the, 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 the procedure. So for every pair of variables vi, vj, we are going to say that vi has an arrow from vi to vj if vj is an argument of the function uh, of vi. Of uh, FI here is just the uh, annotation that the, the function for the variable VI. So VJ appears as an argument. I don't need to say what's the parametric form of, of, of the function or, or what are the arrows that are uh, also playing a role here. I just need to know who is the argument of, the, of whom. And uh, then I can construct this causal diagram. Let's just follow here this example. Uh, we have the variable Z which uh, is just a function of a variable u. u is an exogenous variable. So I point here u, z, pointing to z. Then uh, x is a function of z and another u. So that's why I have this arrow from z to x, and that is the u, x, pointing to x, and so on. So this is an example. I, I try to give an example in natural language processing. I hope I, 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 I be, um, uh, that, that you're going to connect with it. But for example, suppose that X is a product recommendation and the Y is the click-through rate. And uh, uh, I, my interest would be what would be the effect of this arrow here, which is the effect of X on Y. What's the, the effect of this product recommendation on the click-through rate? And there are many other variables that are, uh, 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 that are important or making some is associate, uh, creating some association between this X and Y. And we need to explain what are the relationships between uh, all these variables when you are creating um, uh, the, the causal diagram. So I, I want you to understand here that, that, is a, that, that the causal diagram is actually representing many, many structured causal models because since I'm not specifying the function, this could be any function. And so it's the same causal diagram representing a class of structured causal models. So it's a, a coarser representation of the system. We require less knowledge to represent it. And uh, another uh, uh, part of the causal diagram, which I don't have here in this example, is that uh, if we, sometimes we could have variables use. So this, those, those use are variables that are not observed, but if it, the same you are, um, are shared between two variables, we would have this bidirected arrow. And that in this example, I don't have it, which means that this is a Markovian system. So this is, this is assuming that that, that, that that assumption that I said that's called causal sufficiency, where there's no unmeasured confounder. And this, is, this would be the causal diagram associated to a Markovian system. Now, uh, oh, um, just a note here, uh, we usually remove all the use from the representation just to have a cleaner uh, causal diagram. So uh, we always have the use making these variables uh, stochastic. So we have the, random, the, random, the randomness is uh, generated by, by the use, but you usually don't represent the causal diagram. 
And then like, this is an example where now we have U's that are shared. So we have here this U, X, Z, that, that's uh, both in the function for Z and in the function for X. So when I construct the causal diagram, we will have these U's here that are pointing to both of the variables, right? So we, we, we follow the same process as before. However, uh, when we, since we don't observe those variables, those are going to be represented by a bidirected arrow. So uh, the UXZ, for example, is the, the reason of we have this bidirected arrow between X and Z. And you see here that Z is no longer a, a, an argument of the function of X. It's, it's, so there is no arrow from Z to X. So this is a different causal diagram. And we need to encode those uh, assumptions when you are uh, constructing the diagram. Um, okay, so this is, would be called a semi-Markovian system because we have this measured configuration. All right, uh, you can interrupt me if you need, if you want, to, uh, if you have questions, if, if something is not clear, uh, feel free to just interrupt me. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so now that we know uh, what is a structure causal model. What would be uh, the procedure to understand what, what's the uh, effect of an intervention? So if you are uh, in this pre-interventional world where you are just uh, observing variables, you are not performing any intervention, we would represent the system, uh, suppose that this is the system. And from the system, we, have, we collect data, we, uh, we, 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 we try to estimate the distribution. So everything that we, use, we are used to do it, we are usually, uh, we are usually in this role that's called in pre-interventional intervention role. And the, what you can do from this role is basically a, a prediction. And so can we predict better the value of Y after observing that X is equal to a small X? And uh, if we observe, so those are, uh, so I can compute this, these distributions directly from data. I can estimate these distributions directly from data. And for example, if I observe that the probability of Y, given that I observed the value X equals to X is different than just the probability of Y. This means that the X is helping to help the prediction of Y. So uh, we would say that they are correlated. So this is the conclusion that we usually have when we estimate conditional uh, probabilities or marginal probabilities from observational data from data that's collected in a passive way. However, we want a different uh, conclusion. That's not usually the conclusion that we want to have. We want to have, we want to have a, 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 the, effect, uh, the effect of some, uh, some intervention. So this do operator is representing the fact that we are going in the environment and we are changing the variable X to a small X and this is called do. And in the system, this is represented as, uh, as changing the, the, the function of X to uh, uh, just a constant. So we are setting the variable X as a small X and then everything follows as, 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 uh, as expected. So in the case, Y is not a function of X in this case. So uh, nothing changed in the function of Y. And if we actually had, if we had access to the system and, and we, we have data that's coming from an experimental study, for example, we could just observe what would be the condition of probability coming from the data. And we would observe that the probability of Y after performing an intervention is actually the same as the probability of Y. So the association that I could see in the observational study is actually just a spurious association. In this case, X is not a cause of Y. Um, okay, so we know now what is this two operator means. And uh, uh, I want to give another example here where now uh, we have that Y is actually a function of X. And that if you, again, if I observe, the, if I have data and I observe data from coming from this world, I could just uh, compute or estimate the condition of probability of Y given X coming from the system. And uh, if I perform, uh, if I conduct an experiment, this would uh, have, so the X now it is part of the function of Y. So this is changing the, the value of Y. So when I collect data, for example, I, I run an experiment and then I collect the data. If I just compute the conditional probability coming from this new model after performing the intervention, then I would have exactly this probability of Y given do 
x equals to x. So every time that I have this do here is because I'm talking about this road where we perform an intervention. In this case, the, the, condition of, uh, the condition of probability would be different because we have this confounder here. So that, that is this uxy, that's both argument of the function of x and also argument of the function of y that's inducing some spurious association. So when you compute the condition of probability coming from the observational study, you are going to see a different value than if you are going to, if you had access to this experimental uh, data and then you just compute without, uh, um, you see, th that is no longer a, a confounding because this is change, this is a constant. So there's no spurious association here anymore. And then uh, basically I, I can actually have the causal effect from experimental states. Okay, so as I said, we don't have access in, unfortunately to the system. So how can we now uh, relax the assumption of having this model? We, I don't want to have the model. I don't want to specify the functions. I don't, I don't have knowledge for that. I don't want to make stronger assumptions. So uh, I can try to draw at least the causal diagram. Uh, so I had, I already explained this would be the causal diagram corresponding to the system. So I have this u, x, y, both in, in, x, in the function for x and y. That's why I have a bidirected arrow. Also, x is an argument of the function of y. That's why x is pointing to y. And that after performing an intervention, this would represent in the causal diagram as cutting every edge, every edge that's income to income into x because x is, a, is now a constant. So it's no longer a function of other variables. So everything that was, uh, that, that, that was uh, a parent or a cause of, of x, you are going to remove from the graph. So this is the representation of the system. So once you know what's the causal diagram for the uh, uh, pre-interventional world, you can directly uh, 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 draw the causal diagram in the interventional world by just cutting the arrows into the treatment variable, which is X in the case. And then, uh, so, okay, so we have now the, the structure causal model. The structure causal model is the most, uh, it, 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 is the most, it is a stronger representation of the system. So we, we have the, the the system here. And there is lots of, so when you collect the data, so we usually just have, have access of, uh, to the data, right? So when you have access to the data, there is loss of information. And this is really important to understand that there's loss of information because uh, this is uh, what we are going to use later. But we need to know that there is this flow of information. So we start from the SCM and the SCM induces both the, uh, actually these three components. We, it, it induces the graphical representation of the system using this procedure that I just explained. Uh, also induce the distribution of the variables. And also uh, we can collect data from that that could be uh, another uh, representation of the system. And in the interventional world, we have the same thing. So those, those are different, they are separate worlds. And uh, we, cannot we cannot try to uh, be naive and use information from the left row to estimate something that's in the right row. This is uh, really important to, to have in mind. Um, okay, so uh, let, let, let's try to uh, explain a little bit better. Uh, so this is something that I already explained. So we have the reality that's represented by a structure causal model, and this is inducing causal diagrams, right? And then the causal diagram, uh, the, sorry, the, the, the SCM also induces data. And if I have, for example, access to, 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 to the interventional world, I would have experimental data, but usually I don't have. So what I have in the end is the, the last column here. So I have data that are coming from the observational world. I don't have usually interventional data. And then I can run my favorite uh, algorithm here, and then I can estimate condition of probabilities. And the question is, uh, how can I move from this top, uh, from the observational world to the interventional world? Or how can I move from the, the world where I just observe values or the values of these variables to understand what would happen if I had actually uh, uh, run an experiment and then uh, have access to the causal effects. So uh, that's the question. And um, so 
we usually start with data, right? So uh, that's what we want. Uh, we are data scientists. We want to just use data. And uh, what's the problem here? So if you understood everything that I, that I said, the data is there's lots of information. So actually the same data, the same data set could be explained by a causal diagram like this one. Suppose now that, uh, suppose that this is a data set where I have that X is correlated to Y, okay? So uh, this could be represented uh, by this causal diagram. However, uh, this could also be represented by this other causal diagram where now Y is a cause of X. Here, X is a cause of Y. But this, the same data, it, it's, there's no difference. The same data is explained or could be generated by a system that was represented by this causal diagram. And they are, so the systems are different, but they, they, they induce, they have exactly, uh, uh, they, they generate the same data. And there's many causal diagrams that are all equivalent. And uh, as I said before, a causal diagram is also uh, a representation of many models, right? So there are many, many models. So in the end, this is would be the, suppose that this is the true model. And this is the true model. This is the representation, the graphical representation of the true model. And then how can I know that the, the model, if I just, uh, uh, sorry, uh, if I just uh, perform, like if I just run a deep learning uh, uh, and then get a, a model in the end, how can I know that this is the true model? I could have, I, I, they are all equivalent. They predict that the, the, any predictive task would have a high accuracy uh, uh, using any of these models. Doesn't matter, they are all the same. They are all equivalent for prediction, which is something that we are usually uh, interested uh, in machine learning. So they would, have, they, would, uh, they would have the capability of the pattern recognition to do a classification. They are all performing equally well. And then let me go back a little bit here. Uh, I, I, I was planning to say, if you also assume Markovianity, like if you are uh, not observing all variables in the row, you are actually looking for a model in the subspace of all models. So if you don't consider the possibility that some variable that you don't observe is, con is, is, is inducing some experience association, you never know that uh, you, 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 you actually estimate some models over here while your true model could be outside of this space. It's even worse, right? So how can we now uh, decide from all this model, what's the true one? That's the good question. And you see here that it's, it, from the left to the right, we are encoding more knowledge. We need more knowledge to move from data to the, to the only one model that's actually can explain what's happening in the world. It's the only one. So uh, that, and that, that's explaining the letter of causation by Pearl. So this is in the book of Y. If you read the book, you, uh, you see this picture. And uh, there's three runs. So this is a letter. So that the first run of the letter, it's called associational, where you usually uh, only work, you only rely on, on, on observational distribution. So for example, PY given X, right? So we are just on this passive way of uh, observing things. And uh, you can run uh, here deep neural networks, any supervised or un unsupervised uh, method. You can have like your decision tree. You can use your favorite method here. But usually in the end, you are estimating pretty well the observational distribution. And th those are amazing methods to the prediction. However, uh, the questions that I can answer from these uh, models is about observation. So, uh, how would how would seeing uh, X change my belief in Y? Okay, so uh, after observing that uh, that 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 a user uh, the user got a product recommendation, what what is the chance of him or her uh, buying a product? This is just a chance. I don't know what are what are the the causal explanation for her or for him to buy the product, but this is giving me the giving me the 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 the, the best prediction 
uh, okay? So in, in the medical field, how does a symptom tell us about a disease? So it doesn't mean that this symptom is causing the disease. The, the, the disease is just a, a, a predictor. There's no causal relationship here. Okay, so in this layer, everything that I, I need is a conditional in the observational conditional uh, distribution. Um, observational distribution where I, I, I can obtain conditional dependencies. Uh, however, we usually want to go up in this ladder. So um, the second rung is called interventional. So now I, want, I am interested in the effect or what would be the, uh, the value of Y after, after performing an intervention on some variable. So I, I went there to the environment and I changed the variable X to be equals to small, small X. And I want to know that what, what's the out, outcome, what's the output. Uh, in machine learning, we have reinforcement learning that's doing exactly that because it's, re, it's performing a lot of experiments, it has access to the environment. Uh, but uh, we, uh, the, 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 the causal Bayesian networks, it's also another way of, of uh, reasoning about the effects of interventions. And this is what I, I'm going to cover here. And now the typical question is different. Like, what would be the value of Y if now I intervene on X? You see, there's an action here. So will my headache be cured if I take an aspirin? I'm taking an aspirin. I want to know what will happen. This is not a guess. And the third layer is called oops, counterfactual. Um, and the, oh, <laughs> let's uh, go back a little bit. It's counterfactual. Uh, this is, uh, this requires more assumptions. So in the second layer, uh, I need more assumptions to, to, to reason about the uh, interventions. And the third layer requires even more assumptions. Usually we need the full causal diagram to reason about counterfactuals. Uh, so it's stronger, but this would allow us to uh, uh, estimate individual effects. So I can now uh, see uh, uh, answer questions like, what if I had acted differently? For example, I took an aspirin, but was it the aspirin that stopped my headache? This is a counterfactual question, an introspection question. And uh, we need more knowledge to answer this type of questions. We cannot just uh, run experiments, this type of questions, you really need a model. So we can reason about it, but uh, you need to know that there are assumptions behind it. All right, uh, so the challenge here is about cross-layer inference, because most of the time we, won't, we only have access to observational data that's in the layer one, the layer, the first rung of the ladder. And uh, we want to reason about causal effects. We want explanations. We want to understand what's the best policy, the best treatment, the best decision. How can I do it? And that's what uh, um, uh, I want to uh, explain here. So uh, going back to that figure, the data, the observational data that we usually have, that's in the layer one, in the run one of the letter. Uh, if you have knowledge about uh, how to draw this causal diagram, you are actually encoding knowledge from the layer two, from the interventional role. Uh, yeah, from the interventional role. So you, you are encoding assumptions. And I want you to understand what is assumptions here, because every time that I, I draw a direction, this is an assumption, but also every time that I remove an arrow. So the fact that this G, G4, for example, this fourth graph doesn't have a bidirected arrow here, this is an assumption. It's saying there is no other, uh, uh, there's no uh, third variable that could be gener generating an experience association. This is too strong. So there are two types of assumptions that are playing here uh, that, that, that are important to construct this causal diagram. So is the existence of an arrow and the direction of the arrow. Okay, and uh, this is in the layer two. So if I if I am here in the layer two, uh, I, I, I can reason about interventions. And in the layer three is where we really need the, the model. And if you have the model, we can reason about the uh, uh, counterfactuals. It's the third layer of the run. And that's the theorem that we have that's proved, like it's a mathematical proof that says that the causal, that it's called causal hierarchy theorem, that says that to answer a question that's in the layer I, suppose two, we need information from layer I, in the case two or higher, or higher. Like you cannot just use data. It's impossible. It's 
provable, impossible to just use data, observational data, and reason about uh, causal explanations. You cannot have causal explanations with using data. You need information that's in the layer two. For example, a causal diagram. If there are other types of assumptions that you can make that are about the system that are living in the layer two, but we need more assumptions is required. Okay. Uh, so that is this. Uh, this is a XKCD. It's really funny. Uh, I want you to read it, and then I have a question for you. So let's see. Another huge study found no evidence that cell phones cause cancer. Well, what was the uh, WHO thinking? And the guy says, "Oh, uh, I think they just got it back for." Hmm? Well, take a look. There's, so there's uh, this line here, that's the to total cancer incidence. So this is started in 1970. And then there, there is increasing the, 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 the total number of, uh, uh, of, of cancer cases. And then later, after 10 years, you see this uh, 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 an increase in the cell phone users. So it looks like the cancer is causing the, the increase of, can of cell phone users. And then the guy said, no, uh, you, you are not. There are so many problems with that. And then they said, no, just to be safe until I see more data, I'm going to assume that cancer causes cell phones. So my question for you, uh, we will be able to decide this true relationship just by collecting more data? Who thinks that's yes? Depends on what you mean by more data. Eh, that's a good one. <laughs> that's a very good one, yeah. So uh, you need to know uh, which type of data is that. If it's coming from experimental study, this is good. If it's not, it's not. It's impossible. You can collect infinite data. It's provable that you cannot know if it's mobile phone that's causing cancer or the other way around, or if it's just a experience association. All right, uh, so uh, now I'm going to start the data fusion and causal inference approach. Uh, if you have questions about this introduction, I'm happy have to take. Um, all right, so um, uh, I like this slide here because it's, uh, it, it has first, uh, so this is a, a this is a, the chief the chief economist at, at Google and uh, you see Berkeley, it's a whole variant, he said that. Um, the ability to take data, to be able to understand it, to extract value from, from it, to visualize it, to communicate it, that's going to be hugely important in the next dec decades. Uh, so he's saying about taking data, but also about understanding it, extracting value. So this is important. You, just, you cannot just use data uh, as it is. Also, Gary King, it's a political scientist in Harvard, and he says, Big data is not about data. So it's, it's really about it. He's really right about it. It's not just about data. And the pro uh, said that data science is only as much of a science as, as it facilitates the interpretation of data. It's a two-body problem because it's connecting data to reality. So you need to understand what are the assumptions or uh, how this data was collected. What are the dimensions of this data? Uh, and this was by uh, Yuta Pro uh, in UCLA. It's the father of causality. Okay, so as I said, there's a lot of data out there, um, but they are collected under different experimental conditions, populate different populations, different sampling uh, pr uh, procedures. And not always they are uh, uh, collected by a random procedure as, as it should, or the treatment assignment is also not always random. Uh, uh, sometimes we, we collect data over different variables. So the data is completely messy and uh, they never match the inferential target. So, uh, however, the, that seems pretty sad, but we now understand how to uh, do data fusion. How can we combine these data, uh, these different dimensions of data and uh, decide what's, what's entailed or uh, what, what it allows us to uh, reason about. Uh, and then uh, this is the entire workflow of, of causal inference. Uh, it's really nice because it, it gives us the big picture of, of what, what is happening there in the procedure. So uh, we start with the SCM. So there is this cloud here, it's the SCM. The SCM 
is the root of everything. It's generating the data, right? It's not only generating the data, it's generating, it is it, the it, 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 it truth. Is um, and there's this arrow here that's saying that the data is coming from from there. But there is also knowledge. If you if you had access to the system to, to the model, we would have everything. We wouldn't need causality. It's it's done, right? It's just about cutting, uh, setting the value of x as a constant, and that's it. It's just computing uh, what's the value of the variable. So, but we don't have access. That that's the challenge. So, uh, film data. We need first, the first step of this pipeline is about extracting uh, patterns, uh, uh, estimating the distribution. So this is uh, what we uh, know a lot, how to do it. So this is the first step of the pipeline. Uh, however, uh, sometimes we have access to knowledge. This knowledge can, can come from experimental studies, but can also can come from uh, uh, several years of a lot of experts in the field that understand how they the reality works. Uh, so in natural language processing, I believe you know a lot of, about these language models. You know, you have a structure about the language. How can you leverage this uh, uh, combined with data or the distribution? So that, that's the important part. And when you combine both, you can represent these assumptions or this hypothesis as a causal diagram it doesn't need to be but the causal diagram is really nice because it uh it, it, it's really trans uh, transparent it's really intuitive uh what is happening so once you have this encoder of assumptions so basically all the assumptions that we are making are represented in the causal diagram so once you have the causal diagram you can answer uh questions in the layer uh two in this case um, the layer two is going to, for example, if you want uh, the effect of X on Y, uh, this, that is an engine that's going to uh, see if the knowledge that's encoded here is enough to answer the question that you're interested. And it could be a positive answer, but it could be a negative answer, which means that you need, so if it's positive, perfect, you go there and you do experimental validation and you go, go check if this is true or not. And this is now a new discovery. Now this is knowledge. However, this could be a negative answer, which means that our, our knowledge is still too weak. So we need to go back perform new experiments, observe new variables, doing uh, design, we have to design a new experiment here that's going to generate more data. And then there is like this uh, loop, that's the scientific loop. This is what we want, right? We want to generate data and then knowledge and then combine knowledge and then generate more. Uh, and then uh, in the end, we are going to have this very well uh, understanding of the, the system. So there are this, I would say four uh, steps that are called statistical learning, uh, which is something that we are working right now. Uh, then there's the causal learning. That's the, the, the way that uh, we, we encode the knowledge that we can come, we can extract from data to, and also any other knowledge that you have as a, a encode. So we have an encoder of this hypothesis, could be a causal diagram. Then we, inf we can reason about causality and also we can design new experiments. How can we do this in an optimal way to then uh, help the users or the scientists to get more data or to uh, understand better the system. There's a whole loop here. This is not done at all. This is just a vision, right? So we, we know how to do a lot of, a lot of uh, parts here, but there are many open questions. This is a, a, a new field. Uh, we have, contributions all of the play, uh, all, 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 you know, all, all steps of this pipeline but this this is uh, we, we have a lot of space to work here uh, all right uh, so I will start uh, let's go back here I want to focus here in this presentation on the part of uh, uh, I would say a little bit of B and C so I, I will focus on this middle part here okay uh, and uh, the part of so this is called effect identification is actually uh, how the field is started. So the field started, so that's called class, classical uh, effect identification because it's uh, what we have, uh, uh, it started in 2002. So it's a long time ago already. Uh, and then it assumes that we have three input here. So the first one is your question. So we need to know your question first. So this would be, the, for example, the probability of y given to x, which allow us to, esti uh, to, to estimate the effect of x on y. 
We need these causal constraints. As I said, only uh, data is not sufficient. We, we're sufficient, we need these constraints. And then we, we, uh, we, we, we use all these three inputs in the inference engine, and then we can have a yes answer. And an yes answer actually is going to uh, output this expression to us that is uh, uh, that is expression for the query. So the query is, uh, uh, that is this do here. So this is in the interventional world. And this is, all, this is expressed as only uh, uh, a function of the, the observational distribution. So it's a connection. So this is uh, coming, so it's a way to map all the available distributions. In the case, it's just condition independences here, uh, and conditional uh, observation distributions here. And then it's going to map this to the interventional road and then give you the, the, the answer that you are looking for. So it, that's that that's the meaning of identification. You can use whatever you, you have, only what you have, assuming what's here in the causal diagram, and then you can um, uh, uh, obtain something that's in the interventional world. So this is the, the classical one because it's using only observational data it, and the data is coming from only one population and it's assuming the entire causal diagram. So this is from 2002. Now uh, we have, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, this is, it's possible to have a, a negative answer, right? So this is an example of a causal diagram where the answer is no. So uh, we, we can have that. Like if, you, if, if your knowledge uh, is, is, is you see uh, these bidirected arrows are where we are uh, adding the uncertainties. So if you have bidirected arrows everywhere, which means that you have no knowledge to remove these experience associations, you don't have any identifiability. So in this case, it's a case where you cannot detect what's the effect of X or Y because everything here uh, cannot be controlled for. So this is a negative answer. Okay, so it's possible to have a negative answer. Uh, however, uh, we um, we have some extensions of this uh, this uh, this pipeline, this this engine, and uh, one of them is by uh, uh, Sam Hakli, Juan Correa, and Barry Boyd from 2019, and they extend. So you see, this is more than 15 uh, years after the first algorithm, and this allows us now to uh, combine observational and experimental data. So the data that we have available here is now uh, the observational distribution. So the data allow us to estimate the observational distribution. So we can we have access to the observational distribution, but sometimes we have experiments, not necessarily on the variable of interest. So you see the do here is not on X. My query is a do X, but I had access only to do interventions on another variable. That's, that's Y, uh, W, sorry. And this is called surrogate experiments. So you have access to other experiments, data, data coming from other experiments, and you want to combine, you want to do data fusion. So use all the knowledge that you have in the causal diagram, all the data that you have available. And that's the same graph that, that I couldn't have the answer as uh, just using observational data. But in this case, the solution is yes. And uh, the expression for the PY given to X now is using both. So this is, so you see available distributions is using observational data, but it's also using interventional data. So it's just an expression mapping whatever you want, or having, uh, mapping whatever you have available to the query of interest. So this is a now positive answer. All right. Um, Any questions, sorry? Sure. What are the office? Uh, Sam Hakli, uh, he's now a professor. Uh, what are the, the what? Alphas. Alphas. Oh, it's a uh, it's a uh, waiting. Like this, this, this can be uh, done by two different expressions. Could be only using observational data, or could be just using the experimental data. So uh, you need this part. So this is experimental data. But if you distribute here, you have an expression that's only uh, uh, depending on the observation of data. So you can have like zero, alpha zero. Those are the weights. You don't depend on the amount of data. Yeah, you can decide depending on. Uh, uh, so this, there is no way of, uh, of, of choosing this in an optimal way. So these are just general. We are saying that they're, they're, they're both expressions uh, are mapping to the correct effect in the limit of data. Uh, but uh, if you if you have more certain about uh, or you have more data in one domain, you can decide to use this one. 
uh, right? Um, that's it. Uh, so now some examples. Uh, I, I want again to uh, stress that uh, the Markovian case here is a case where uh, we have identifiability on everything because exactly of this uh, theorem. So if, uh, if, you, if you have a causal diagram G with no unmeasured confounders, this means that there's no bidirected arrows, okay? So this is an example of a graph that's Markovian. We can just, we, we don't need that engine. We just need to compute this expression because we always have access to the parents, right? So basically we can uh, control for the parents. Uh, this, that is, a, if, 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 if you know regression, uh, this would be uh, exactly adding this as a covariate or a predictor. So controlling for could be done by regression, but doesn't need to be. Uh, basically, that's the expression that we need to compute. And uh, you need to now uh, reweigh the probability of Y given X and the parents using the probability of the parents. So if you have access to the parents, you're done. Uh, basically, it's just computing this expression, okay? Uh, so the parents here is just a variable V and that's it. Uh, oh, sorry, it's, it's a change. This is a, this should be the parents. It's a, sorry. <laughs> yes, uh, that's the parents of X. So you sum over the parents. And this is, a, a, I'm using the notation for discrete variables, but could be an integral here if it's an, uh, uh, a continuous variable. Uh, all right. Uh, so if you don't have uh, Markovianity, so if you have a measured confounders, I need some tools to help you to identify the effect. And basically I need this separation. Um, it's very basic, but I think it's important to cover here. This is a tutorial. So uh, this, if you know Bayesian networks, probably you know this tool. This is not necessarily from causal inference. This is for Bayesian networks in general, uh, but you need this separation. You also need do calculus. Now do calculus is a, a uh, it, it, it's a, I could say it's an extension of this separation to the interventional world, but I, I will explain a little bit. And then we need to identify algorithm that's at least uh, necessary because uh, we need an, an automatic way to reason about these effects uh, for large domains and uh, to, to have a, 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 to be efficient. efficient. Okay, so those are the three. You can check those uh, tools uh, in the Pearl's Bible. <laughs> That's the, 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 the big uh, book uh, by Pearl. Uh, also, uh, the Identify Algorithm is by Jin Tian in his thesis in 2002. Uh, if, you, if you really want to understand the details, check his thesis. It's really hard, but I feel uh, uh, it's beautiful. Uh, it's really nice. Um, so to understand this separation, I'm going to cover here. I hope it's not too boring, uh, but uh, we need to understand the act, what is an active and inactive triplet in a graph. So an active triplet uh, could be uh, this chain. So it could be actually these three, those are the three active triplets and they have the, the expected behavior, like the, the, that's normal here because they have the expected behavior. And I like to see this as active as thinking that that is a flow of information. So for example, the information that's coming from X to Y is flowing without, no, without problems. Like it's just flowing. There's no interruption. Do you understand what I mean uh, later? So again, like the, the, the flow of Y to X is, there's no uh, interruption. Uh, here, the flow from Z to Y and X is there's no interruption. So X and Y, they are all, uh, uh, these triplets are all connecting. So they, 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 the information are flowing here without problems. Um, uh, now, if I uh, condition on a variable, so I need uh, I, the, the activity or an activity of a tri triplet depend on a set. This is uh, 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 with respect to a set of variables. And suppose that our set of variables is just the set, the variable Z here. So if I, uh, and, and I'm going to say condition on, but this is, uh, uh, you are going to understand later why I'm saying that, but when you use this set as Z, uh, I'm, it's, 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 it's like if I, I'm blocking the flow. So if, I, if I'm, I'm conditioning on Z, this flow of, of from information from X to Y is now interrupted because I'm conditioning on Z. So those three triplets are now inactive if uh, with, with respect to a set of variables that includes Z. 
Uh, the abnorm abnormal behavior uh, is, uh, is now those three, two triplets. That's not a triplet actually, but uh, the first one, uh, if we condition on, uh, on this variable that has two arrows pointing to it, this is called collider. So uh, if we are conditioning on a variable that's a collider, we are opening the flow. So uh, X and Y are connecting uh, or connected uh, conditioning on Z. And thus, if I just condition on a descendant of a collider, I have the same behavior. So X and Y are, are act, uh, connected uh, given Z because I'm conditioning on the descendant of a collider. Um, and uh, if I don't condition on the collider, they are blocked. So the, the, this is interruption of the flow. So X and Y, they are, uh, uh, this is an inactive triplet because X and Y are disconnected. They are not connected uh, if I don't condition on Z because this is blocked, right? And uh, this, this is the, just a particular case just to make the, the parallel here, but X and Y are disconnected because W here is the point. Uh, any questions up to this point? Sure. How conditioning here makes it active? Um, uh, let's try to make an example here. Um, uh, suppose two variables are a cause of the same variable. Uh, I, I'm terrible with examples. Suppose um, rain uh, and uh, I think that's an example for the book of why. So if, if you suppose that you have rain and the uh, sprinkler, so they are uh, uh, they are both independent uh, from each other. Like the making like the rain is independent of turning on the sprinkler. Uh, however, if you observe an effect, suppose that now you are seeing that the floor is wet, okay? Now, given that I observe that the, wet, the, the floor is wet, those events are no longer uh, independent because if you know that there's, there is no rain, it's the only possibility is that the sprinkler is on. You see, so that it, observing an effect creates an experience association between, between two unrelated events. And this could be a descendant as well, because there's this two, uh, it's a proxy. So basically it's, it's the same idea. All right, so those are, are triplets. So three variables, what about larger structures? Uh, all right, so now it's about this separation. And this separation is actually uh, in our uh, context here, you be a oracle of conditioning dependence. So I explain uh, now. But uh, let's understand first what's a, a, a connection between in a path. So there is a path between X and Y, and this path is is said to be inactive if at least one triplet of this of this path is inactive. You just need one. Okay. So for example, this is a path. It's not so long, but <laughs> there are four variables now. Uh, and then uh, let's see. Uh, I just need one triplet. What about the end set? It's not blocking this triplet, it's not block, blocking this triplet. So they are not inactive, they are active. X and Y are connected. What about the set B? B is blocking out this triplet. So I just need one, that's fine. So this path, this entire path is inactive. The same for W, right? And they're both, well, I don't need both, but if you condition on both, it's still fine. It's just still inactive. Now, what about this other path? Uh, if I condition on uh, the amp set, the amp set, uh, there's this collider here, there's this collider here. So if I condition on nothing, basically this is, this is a collider, so it's already inactive. So both triplets are inactive, so I'm fine. If I condition on B, I'm opening this triplet, but it's okay because there's still this that's inactive. So you'll be okay. Right, double is the same, it's just symmetric. But if I condition on both, I, now I open both triplets, there is no inactive triplet in my, my path. So this path uh, is active and X and Y are connected, right? And connection uh, actually, 
in, in, in the cause of that in a Bayesian network. So this is a concept for Bayesian networks. It's called the separation or the connection because the some directed path. So this is a D is a direction thing. Uh, so this is for directed. So we say that X and Y are D separated given Z. And this is denoted as using the same simple symbol for independence. So X will be separated from Y given Z in the graph. If every path, so you have to check all every path in the graph that's going from X to Y, and they have to be all inactive, all right? If they are all inactive, then X and Y are disseparated. And that is this connection, as I said, it's called global Markov proper, that uh, if you observe that two variables, don't say variables could be even sets, if sets, you, you, you just check variable by variable in the, in, the, in, this, in the set. But if you have like a set of variables that it's completely uh, disseparated from another set of variables Y given some set Z, then this reflects in the condition, in the observational, uh, in, the, in the distribution of the variables that X is independent of Y given Z. So there's a connection now between what's encoded in the graph and what's, what could be uh, represented in the, in the distribution, okay? That's called global Markov proper. All right, now you know the separation. You are now an expert. <laughs> uh, and uh, the calculus is uh, how can I uh, reason about those type of separations, but in interventional graphs. So it's a, there's a new, uh, so we are, this are, it, it's a way of uh, uh, understanding invariances between the layer one and the layer two of, uh, of the, the, the letter of causation. So let's see the first rule here. Uh, it's a little bit complicated. I'm going a little bit fast here. Doesn't don't, don't worry. It's hard. Uh, but I want you to understand that those those rules exist. But basically, uh, that is a way. Uh, if if this was like if W here uh, was uh, uh, sorry, if the do x here doesn't exist. So suppose that x is the end set. Uh, remove the do x from both sides here. So we are actually encoding that Z uh, is independent of Y given W, right? So this is common independence for us. However, now this is under an intervention on X. So that's an interventional role. So the first rule is the extension of, the, of uh, condition independence in the graph where uh, we, we, we cut the arrows into the variable X because it's the intervention on X. So that's it. So the rule two, uh, now I'm going a little bit faster, but the, the rule two is when you want to exchange. Now you want to change a do to a C do. C, when I see C, it's like observes Z. So you can have invariance. The fact that you are observing and the fact that you are acting on Z is the same. Uh, if this is a separation that you observe in the interventional graph. And this is the annotation where we cut the arrows into X, and you also cut the arrows out of Z. So you do this manipulations on the graph. And if this holds, if this separation holds, then you can change some do to not do or C observe Z. In this case, I'm changing. Those are invariances between the, the observational role and the interventional role. And I can do this as, uh, com uh, as removing completely the do as well. Like if I have this other separation here, now I'm cutting the arrows uh, into, into X and also the arrows into the, um, there's this notation here, Z, W. Those are the set of, set of nodes Z that are not ancestors of W. But uh, once you have this manipulation of the graph, you can, if this is holding, then you can remove completely the do Z. And then you can use this calculus, calculus to uh, make manipulations in the distributions with the do's and see if in the end you can remove the do's completely. And then if it is exists, if this expression that's completely do free, uh, this would have a, uh, this would be a mapping from the observational role to the interventional role. Then this means identifiability. Uh, of course, this is impossible to do uh, for large graphs. Maybe for a few variables, you can do it. But uh, uh, we have this algorithm. Doesn't it sure read it? <laughs> but this is the general identify algorithm. And this is just for you to know that uh, this, that is a, a reasoning here that's not actually using directly the calculus, but that is uh, a mapping between uh, the, the, the expression that's going to be output here and the, the calculus. 
And this is uh, uh, the general identifiability that I mentioned to you. Uh, and um, I want to uh, show you an example because this is really uh, popular in the field. Uh, that's called backdoor adjustment. This is just one example. I want to stress that this is just an example where your graph is like this one. Okay, it's very simple. And uh, that's the, that's the, 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 uh, the theorem. Like suppose that we have a variable X and it's called a, a treatment because it's, it's the variable that I, I could intervene on. Uh, and I want uh, I want to know the, uh, well, and I have this variable y here, that's uh, the outcome variable, I, 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 it could be a set, but this is just uh, x and y. Uh, and then I want to ask you, uh, is there a set in this graph that blocks all the paths that are into x? So for all paths that are actually has a, a narrow head into x here, is there a set that I can condition on and block all this backdoor path that they are called backdoor paths. Uh, and this set Z cannot have a descendant of X. Is there a set here that blocks the backdoor path? No one? Uh, if it exists, this is, called, is, is going to uh, call a, a set that's admissible for backdoor adjustment and then the effect will be this one. And uh, in this example, it exists. The, the, set, the set that's only the variable V is going to block this path here. It's the only one that has an arrow into X. It, it's called backdoor. And the variable V here, there's two paths actually. The one that uh, is through this directed arrow from V to X, from V to Y, so this path here. And there's this other path that's through the bidirected arrow. So there are two paths that are, by, uh, that are into X. And by, by conditioning on V, I block both. Both. So it's fine. If I just condition on V, so if I replace Z here as V, my expression will be like that. So this is uh, called backdoor adjustment and only works if the set that you are talking about blocks all the backdoor paths. Okay. Um, this is an example that this doesn't hold. You see why? So the, the variable V here, if I condition on V, I'm open the collider. However, so I don't, if I don't condition on V, there is this second path through here that's open, okay? So if I condition on V, I'm doing this spurious association here, but if I don't condition on V, there exists this other spurious association. So there is no way of controlling for a variable and get a, 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 a clear uh, effect of the X on Y. So this is what we call that the effect of X and Y is not identifiable, it's no identifiable, there's no way. And this is like very important because if you don't know what's happening with your variables and you're just controlling for everything that you have, what's the chance of having a path like that? And then you, what, what, what can you say about the effect that you observed later? If you don't condition on V, is is spurious. If you condition of V, it's spurious. So you don't, you cannot say anything about what will happen. So it's just that. So it's impossible to know. Um, we have, oh, sorry. In that example, if there were no common causes of V and Y, then would it be okay? No common cause, of, yes. Uh, oh, wait, there's no common cause of V or Y. Well, you can say that the U. In, in yeah, there's no common cause here, right? If, if there, no, I mean, if there's no arrow in the right. So this one here. Yeah. Yes, works. It, it, it works. works. Okay. So the backdoor doesn't need to be the, the simplest one. You just need a set that blocks all the backdoor paths. But there are many, many cases where we can open some paths. What's the chance? It's really hard. But it, you're right. Like, if that, that arrow here doesn't exist. I was saying the other one, yeah, okay. In that case, if if that that arrow, if if this path here, the bidirected doesn't exist, yes. yes. Okay. Now, if that arrow here doesn't exist, you cannot condition yes. it. Then the effect is just y given x. 
Uh, okay, so we have fusion, so you don't need to know any, any of this stuff. So for example, just draw your graph and uh, you say that you want the effect of X and Y. Uh, I, I'm late, I don't know. Um, yeah, uh, you're looking there. All right. Uh, so you, we have fusion. If you if you wanna if you know what's the graph, you just draw your graph here, and then you ask the effect of x and y, and you have the answer. Uh, that that's exactly the graph that he asked me now. Uh, you can draw it here, and uh, the expression is exactly the same. This is two vector adjustment. It's the other way, it's symmetric. This is two vector adjustment. However, this is not identifiable, and uh, it, it will say to you that it's not identifiable. Uh, there are in, actually in, in, infinite scenarios beyond backdoor, right? I hope so. <laughs> so uh, backdoor is just one rare, uh, rare, uh, particular example. This is the called M graph, where uh, the effect is just py given x. So Okay, you observe the variable, but that that you need to be really clever about how to use it. In this case, you cannot use it. <laughs> so be careful. Uh, the front door is this one. So you have some confounder between X and Y. So it looks like it's impossible to solve this problem. However, if you have a mediator, we call it this variable as mediator because it's mediating the effect of X and Y. Uh, we have this huge expression here to solve. It's, completely unclear right now how this is related to any of the methods that probably you know how like regression that we need to use this expression to actually get the effect we have the conditional from door now there is like a z there confounding something you need to condition on more stuff here so it's a different variable i mean a different expression you have uh, the napkin that's a famous famous one it's in the book of why professor elias barimboy actually was the one that uh, discovered this graph <laughs> it's funny. Um, uh, that's a new expression. It's really different. Um, there's a named one. Maybe you can have one that has your name. <laughs> so this is a named one. Uh, it's another different expression. The point is there are infinite, infinite graphs, and we cannot do uh, only one method for all of them. You need to know what's your causal diagram. And once you know it, then you do causal identification. Uh, that's why we need fusion, right? So you draw your causal diagram, then you have the expression here. All those that I showed to you, you can get it here. Uh, even that, that one that's using uh, uh, interventions, those are like, I have available, I, I have a way to say that I have available the probability uh, from the observational studies. I also have the uh, experimental data and then intervention on W, and then it's going to give me the right expression. More uh, on causal identification, we have a, so this, this type of intervention is called atomic intervention because I'm defining the dual X as changing the expression as a constant. However, we have different types of interventions actually. So those called soft intervention, you could replace X as a different function. Right? You just you could have a, for example, in for imperfect intervention. Sometimes you don't know if you're actually going to change. Like you, you perturb a gene, what's the chance of changing actually the gene? This is imperfect, but you can you can change the probability of the, the variable x being another value, and then you can model this. And this is called softer or uh, uh, stochastic intervention. And we have a calculus, a new do calculus just for this new type of intervention that's called stochastic calculus. And uh, this is by Juan, 2020. Uh, we have a lot of methods for identification, even counterfactuals, uh, a lot of things. Uh, identification, uh, when there are selection bias, selection bias is uh, uh, something that sometimes happens. You observe data only in a, in a narrow, uh, uh, like in, in, a, in, a, in a particular section of your domain. Like for example, suppose that you observe only uh, books in Portuguese. So you, you need to know that you're conditioning on the, the, the variable that S, that's the language, is Portuguese. You cannot, it, this is selection bias, right? So you, you cannot just extrapolate to other, uh, other things. You, you need to know that your data is coming from this specific uh, environment. Uh, and then we, we have ways of uh, extrapolate for uh, under this uh, selection bias as well. 
All right, so I think it's almost on time. <laughs> so uh, questions, if you have, like I have one minute, but I also, I'm going to the coffee break, we can discuss there, but I, I'm happy to take questions. Sure, yeah. Um, thank you for the um, So I wanted to ask if do you think it makes sense to use um, the origin of prosaic presentations um, for, for example, the origin class like in a presentation translation? Also, like in a lengthy like setting, does it make sense to see prosaic like, being one when you can it's preserved at the version? Yes, it doesn't. <laughs> No, of course. Um, so everything depends on, on, on your goal. Uh, I can see how to use it. I don't know if this is your goal, but for example, if you want to understand why, the, so you have a, if you want explainability, you want to understand why uh, some text was generated, then yeah, you need a model for that, at least in a form of a causal diagram, at least you understand what are the variables that are uh, uh, what is the mechanism that's that's being used to, to generate this data? Or for example, if, you, uh, if you're generating data based on an image, right? So sometimes you wanna, you, you wanna know what would be the effect of changing, I don't know, a car to a bicycle. This is a changing, right? So what would be the effect of changing a, a car to a, a, a bicycle in the text? That's the why. This is an interventional question there. Uh, you need to be created here, <laughs> but uh, yeah, or sometimes sentimental analysis, like what's the chance, uh, what, what, what would be the effect on, um, um, like in the sentiment of the text, that the, the text, if I change one word to another, right? It, so every time that you are changing and you want to know what would be the effect, this is effect of information. So I, I have a, a conceptual question that I don't know if it's for all people, but I just want to do it. Yes, yes, yes. So um, I do not understand exactly the difference between having the dashes, like the dashes by the dashes uh, arrows, and having like a, a new loop that connects D2 to Y, for example. Uh, the difference is that the variable that's connecting V, oh, wait, I, I don't know if I understood your question. So you're talking about if I have a variable here pointing to V and to Y at the same yeah, time. Yeah, and what's the difference between this and having the dash, dash line? Right. Uh, this is just a, 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 a similar way of representing that variable that we're talking about and saying that this variable is not observed. Okay. So that's the difference. I could have the U here pointing to V and to Y, but it's a U variable. You don't have it in your data set. It exists, it's creating the confounding, but you don't have it. So you cannot use it. Okay, so uh, if it's uh, observable and unobservable, both would be called uh, confounders or- Yeah, or yes, but the... one is an observed confounder and the other is confounded. Okay. Thank you for the talk. What kind of new problems could be solved with this technique? Or in general, something that we couldn't read really before? Um, I think uh, maybe I should come back like this. Uh, maybe this one is better. Um, So I try to summarize a few things here. Uh, so first is about data fusion. So you cannot just blindly put everything in a bag and use it. 
So you need uh, you need to understand the, the difference of the generation of this type of data that you have that you have available, and then you do it in a principal way. And uh, then uh, the second problem is about identifiability. So uh, the distinguishing the the the, the distinguishing the, the distinction uh, between uh, association and causation, uh, this is new, like uh, not, not every method can do it. Like usually those predictive models, they are able only to detect association. So in the end, this, is, this answer doesn't give you what you are usually expecting that like, can I understand what's happening in the model and then uh, maybe uh, have a better understanding about the environment? So this type of uh, reasoning and explanation, this is something that you cannot do it without causality. Uh, because of that part that I explained that multiple models actually are equivalent to make predictions. So you never know if those, if you, if you actually fit the, the right one. Uh, generalizability, like, uh, that, that's about uh, moving to new environments. So you need knowledge to know, I'm going to talk uh, in the, the next uh, part, uh, how can you transport some knowledge from one environment to another? You cannot do this. People are calling it as out of distribution uh, prediction, but it's a little bit different. Like you, you really know the causal effect on the environment and uh, you want, you need knowledge about the, the new environment. You cannot just blindly say that this is going to work everywhere. You need to know what's the change, what was the difference between the, the environment that you trained the day, that you trained the model and the one that's are going to apply. And uh, explainability that's a nation. And one example is friends. Yeah, coffee. <laughs> I'm happy to share. Oh. Yeah. 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 Uh, just introdu introducing the uh, notation and explain the, explaining the concepts. The second part, I'm going to uh, cover most of the uh, novel methods that we have. I, I hope it'll be more exciting. Um, and uh, uh, after having the identification expression, we usually want to estimate the effect, right? So that, that huge expression that we had in the end, and not, not the, it's not the, the final uh, estimate of, uh, of the effect of interest. So this part is about effect identification. And uh, uh, I will start with the uh, most common graph that's used in the, uh, in the film. So uh, if you remember, I discussed about the backdoor criterion where if you have this set Z that blocks all the backdoor paths between X and Y, then the expression, uh, the, 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 the probability of y given to x, this is an intervention distribution, is just uh, given by this uh, sum over uh, the probability of y given x and z and uh, multiplied by p of z. Um, uh, what, what people uh, uh, do in the, in the field is that uh, you can rewrite this expression by adding a probability of x given z in the numerator and also in the, in the denominator. So basically you're just multiplying by one here, so there's nothing crazy. But uh, the denominator the now, it's called, it, it's exactly the factorization of the joint distribution. Um, uh, so if you see here, uh, a graphical model usually induces uh, a factorization of the joint distribution by uh, showing that the variable so you see here, the first term is the probability of y given x and z because um, in, our, in our case, z is just the variable z. Uh, so y is the, the, the part that's before the bar and the, what, what is after the bar is what is uh, a parent of y. So, uh, if you, so this is just the product of the variable given the parents. So you multiply for each variable, you multiply the, the conditional uh, distribution of the variable given the parent. So, and this gives you uh, the, uh, the, the joint distribution. This is the factorization. So because of that, you can rewrite this as the joint distribution of py given, no, sorry, py, x, and z. And in, in the, denominator, the, uh, the denominator, this is called a propensity score in the field. And you can use, uh, 
your favorite uh, uh, estimator here to estimate this probability here. Uh, that's called uh, propensity score. Uh, note, just wait a little bit. Okay, uh, so so note here that this method uh, it is it's uh, it's depending on the fact that the variable z, the set of variable z, is admissible for backdoor adjustment. This doesn't work for any graph. Okay. Uh, and uh, this technique is called inverse probability weighting or, uh, or via propensity score. And uh, this is sometimes, that is a framework in causality that's called potential outcome framework. And this assumption, the, the assumption that, that you can uh, use this formula uh, to estimate the causal effect is usually uh, uh, assuming a condition that's called ignorability condition. So if you know this field a little bit, Basically, what they are assuming uh, uh, by saying that this is that is this condition again of the assumption is that the graph is uh, it's called a backdoor graph where that exists is this, that the set Z that they are going to consider for this adjustment is a set of variables that are blocking all the backdoor paths. So this is a good example on, on uh, how the graphical approach allow us to understand better the assumptions because when you're using the propensity score, this is usually an independence between uh, the potential uh, outcome and that uh, this is really uh, hard to understand. Uh, so if you know this field, I, I also recommend you to understand the connection between the fields because the, the graph model will allow you to understand all what, what's the meaning of all these assumptions that are behind uh, the, the methods there. Uh, so this is the most famous uh, and the most used method in the field. Um, to be honest, uh, it's it's very strong uh, this assumption that that exists because usually you don't you don't need to understand what are the variables in the set Z. You blindly assume that the set set V as uh, the set Z that could be of with all the covariates that could or all the variables that you measure in your data set, this is what people usually do uh, in the field. They just uh, uh, assume that the a very high dimensional set of variables is going to block all your vector paths. And they just apply this formula and they say that they, in the end, the, the effects, the causal effect. But of course, this is under the assumption that this sets, the, set, the, the, set the set of variables is blocking the vector path. If you, if you believe that this is true, that's fine. But if you don't believe it, uh, that's not the correct way of doing it. Uh, so uh, we have better way, uh, a better way of doing it. Like if you, if you have like your own graph, doesn't need to be the background, the backdoor graph anymore. So for example, the nap napkin. We have this uh, paper by uh, Jung and uh, Jin Tian and by, uh, by Diaz Barenboim that's showing how can you uh, rewrite the expression that you saw in the first part. So this was like a, uh, a very, uh, it's a monster almost. So that is like a, this very hard expression here, but it, that, that is a, a, they, they proved in the paper that, it, that, that, that exists is always a way of rewriting any expression for any graph that you have. That is a way to rewrite this expression as a, a, a arithmetic function of backdoor adjustments. So you'll be a function of backdoor adjustments. So people have a, a lot of understanding. They have a lot of experience working on the backdoor graph. So we have many good methods to estimate the backdoor uh, adjustment formula. And uh, this is leveraging, uh, leveraging this, this knowledge because now you can rewrite any expression as a function of backdoor adjustments. Um, uh, to be fair, is actually called uh, multiple sequential backdoor adjustments. It's, it's a little bit different, but the, the frameworks uh, that are available is to work on this uh, on this setting. And this in this example, you can see that in the numerator, we have a backdoor adjustment here uh, for the effect of z on x and y. So the effect of z one, sorry, the effect of z one on x and y and saying that the Z2 blocks the backdoor paths between X and Y. And the, in the, the, the denominator is another adjustment saying that the, 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 the effect of Z1 on X is also given by a backdoor adjustment over Z2. Um, 
maybe we can even explain here, like, uh, for example, the denominator, you can see that the effect of Z1 on X, okay, so this arrow here, the effect of this arrow, what are the backdoor paths between uh, Z1 and X? So we have this one here, and we have this other one here. So this one is open because uh, we have Z2 as a known collider. So conditioning on Z2, we block this path. Uh, also, uh, this other path here, well, it's already blocked by Y, but doesn't matter. I can also condition on Z2 with this, is not a problem. So Z1, the effect of Z1 on X is actually true that this is a back, given by backdoor adjustment. Uh, well, the same for the effect of Z1 on X and Y. So Z and Y, uh, sorry, X and Y could be uh, seen as a, 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 a vector here. So the paths that are going from Z1 to X and Y are the same. So that is this one here, and that is this other one here. So the Z2 is again, uh, uh, admissible for the effect of Z1 on X and Y. So you, you, you have a way to rewrite any expression as a combination of backdoor adjustment. And this is awesome because we have all these tools already available for this adjustment. Um, and uh, okay, so we have in this case, uh, in the denominator and in the denominator two backdoor uh, adjustments. And uh, the idea, I won't cover here the details. So in the second part, I just wanted to get excited about the field. Sorry, okay. Yeah, so just a question. So uh, isn't there a Z1 that's missing in the first uh, example? Right? A Z1 missing? So Z1. No, no, it's the effect of Z1 on X and Y. So you are just using just the two as a set. So I want the effect of Z1 on uh, both variables, okay? And that quotient, the whole quotient depends on Z1. The whole quotient? You're not summing the effect of Z1. No, no, Z1 would be the, the treatment here. So let's go back in the here. You see the, the X is not summing over X. So our X, our treatment is Z1, the other one. What? Function on the left, P of Y do X does not. Oh, no, no, what? what? P Y do X here, okay, the effect of X on Y, it's given by this, this fraction. But that fraction depends on Z1. So for what value of Z1? Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, yeah, that's that expression is weird. You could you could choose any value, but you need it. You need to condition on Z1. You can choose any value you want. You always get the same result. You always get the same result. Yeah, maybe add something for any Z1. Yeah, yeah, it would be better. But yeah, uh, this is a good one. Like I, when I started uh, uh, learning about this this graph, is is really weird how how that is a variable. <laughs> That's not doing anything here. Yes, it's any value. It works for any value. Um, uh, all right. So basically we need to rewrite this as a score. Doesn't matter here, but in the end you have the, the, the DML. The DML means uh, double uh, machine learning estimator. And uh, it's really nice because we have this double robustness. Uh, so, this is just an example of how can you uh, leverage the machine learning methods for vector adjustment. You could have, you could use others, but this one, uh, so this is a paper by Jung. He chose this method because he has several uh, good properties, uh, statistical properties. One of them is double robustness, which means that uh, you could even, uh, so this estimation of this score here is going to depend on two uh, conditional distributions. And this is, these two distributions uh, is double robustness because if you only one of them are correctly estimated, estimated, you are going to still estimate without uh, any bias. So uh, it's really nice. Uh, all right. Um, that is another way that uh, this is a, a new paper uh, in 2021 that's called the causal ne neural connection. That's the first time that we have a connection between deep neural networks and causal inference. And uh, uh, in this paper, uh, this is by Kevin Shia, uh, Kaizen Ling, uh, Benjo, and Byron Boyne. So they, they have this paper where they introduce these neural causal models. And the idea is actually simple, uh, although the paper is really hard. 
But the, the idea uh, I'm trying to give you the intuition is basically that uh, there exists this true model that I told you to, uh, before. Uh, and then it, it, it induces a causal diagram. So uh, following the, the pro-causal hierarchy, we still need the causal diagram. Uh, it's not possible to just use deep learning and uh, get a, a causal effect. However, if you have a causal diagram encoding your assumptions, you can uh, bias, uh, the, so you, you can construct this framework where for every arrow uh, in the causal diagram, you have a deep neural network. So for example, we have this graph. This is a from Tondor graph, if you remember, but that is uh, like X, that is this variable U, X, Y. So we will need to incorporate the variables, the exogenous variables, because the system has to uh, search over all the space of uh, models. So we need to incorporate the U's, okay? So the U will be a pair, you'll be, uh, uh, you feed the, the, the deep neural network with this U, and this you generate the variable X. Uh, also, the variable X is needed to create the variable Z, right? So depends on another U. So the variable Z is a function of X and U Z, and this function will be a neural network. Uh, the same for Y. Y is a function of Z and a function of the U X Y. So we need to use both and the function is a deep neural network, and then it's going to generate the variable y. Uh, and we need, so they proved uh, that uh, we need uh, to induce this bias to, uh, to be able to have power or uh, the capability of, of, uh, of, of doing, uh, making uh, causal inferences. Uh, so let me explain a little bit better how you uh, actually construct this network. Uh, so we use the same endogenous variables. So these are the observed variables. Uh, the set of variables U are actually are, uh, you need to uh, uh, compose something that's called click. Uh, it's not so hard to understand. Click is like a set of variables where well, all the variables are connected by bidirected variables. So what are the clicks here? So X and Y is a click and it has to be maximal. So it, it's okay, this is the maximal uh, click. X and Y are connected with a bidirected arrow and this is one click. Z is another click because it, it's connected, it's alone, but it's another click. So you need a U for every click. So uh, the U X Y is needed because it's connecting the click X Y and we need the U Z because Z it's another click. So we will need to uh, enlarge our data set with the use, this is needed. And also uh, we will create a neural network for, uh, to generate each variable uh, given the parents following the topology of the graph. And uh, we can uh, impose, for example, the, the uniform distribution for the use. Uh, this is uh, the, the, the uh, uh, just just to give you to, to not uh, uh, assume to, this is the most uncertain distribution so we can just use the uniform distribution and uh, uh, with this indu inductive bias we can actually uh, uh, constrain the neuro neurocausal model with the ability to solve causal inference tasks uh, what I mean, uh, it's, it's really delicate here the meaning of uh, being able to compute <laughs> causal effects I'm trying to explain better uh, the true causal model, it's, it's there, it's unknown. And uh, the, the pro-causal hierarchy says that uh, it induces the three layers of uh, causation, right? So, uh, but this is unknown. And uh, the causal diagram is induced by this graph, by, by this system. And uh, we want to know if it just adding these constraints in this, in this new, it, it's a proxy model. We want to know uh, if, uh, they are going to induce their own layers. It's a different set of layers. Those are different uh, uh, models. So the induce uh, distributions are different, right? Uh, the layer one is the same because I'm using data. Data is from the layer one. So the layer one, the, 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 the uh, deep learning has the capability, the expressiveness for learning uh, all observational distributions. So they will be uh, a good match. Uh, but the question is, what about the layer two? Uh, I want a question. So my query is about a causal effect. So this query is in the layer two. 
is this is the layer two induced by this train model you'll be able you'll be a match this is unknown and uh, th th there is a theorem that uh, says that uh, there is always an SCM, that is always an NCM uh, M hat, which is a proxy, that you have uh, a, a, the ability to, meet, to, to match the three layers of the PCA. So this is a little bit abstract, uh, but uh, I, I, I will uh, uh, clarify later. But one thing that I want you to understand here is that uh, this doesn't mean that the, the M hat, it is the M star. They are just a props. They are different uh, models, okay? But constructing the, 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 the module with this inductive bias, they have the expressiveness of uh, uh, generating information in the three layers. They have the ability, but they are not the same. They are, th those are different concepts. And uh, how, so how can we then uh, leverage this, this ability of, of uh, uh, this high capability of having the three layers? So we have this algorithm, the algorithm is not, not hard, so I'm going to parse here. Uh, so, uh, okay, uh, first we, let's read the input. The input is a, a query. We need this query. The, the query is one of the, the input. We, we need data, that's the L, L1. So it's, it's the observational data. And uh, this helps you to uh, estimate the observation distribution. And you need the causal diagram. We need this knowledge. And then we construct the uh, neurocausal module following that procedure that I just explained, uh, where every arrow will be a neural network. We will follow uh, the topology of the causal diagram. We will add the exogenous variables as additional variables. So this is what we call a neurocausal model. However, we are going to have two uh, optimization approaches here. One is going to minimize our period. So we are going to learn a model that's going to minimize the causal effect, okay? At the same time, we'll have another optimization approach that's going to maximize this causal effect. And the idea here is pretty simple. Like if you remember, um, there, there are many models that have, that they are equivalent in the sense that, in the sense that they are all equivalent. They all explain in the same way the observational data. So if you train a model just to match the observational distribution, you, you are not able to know which, which model is going to be uh, trained. However, by, doing, uh, by, by training this model, by maximizing and, mixing, uh, maximizing and minimizing one specific query, we, 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 we will have the ability to know if the difference between the maximum and the minimum is zero. If they are matching, this means that for every model in the space of models that are explaining the same observational data, the causal effect is the same. The minimum and the maximum are the same. So they are all matching. They all have the same causal effect, right? So it doesn't matter which model you have in the end, you can estimate the causal effect from this process. So we still have to be very careful here because we have identifiability for this specific query but the model is not the correct one. So if you want to explain ability, this is not, a, this is not good yet, right? So you, you'll be able to identify one specific effect, the effect of X on Y, because this is the cure. You are going to have a, 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 this, the, 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 you, you'll be certain that this is the correct cause of effect, but it's one arrow, one arrow of the system. It's not everything. And uh, this is also nice because it's at the same time that you are uh, identifying an effect, you are estimating. So this is the first time that we have a one approach that, that uh, instead of having that, that expression and then you have a, a way to estimate later, you have at the same time uh, the, the capability of, uh, of uh, identifying and uh, uh, estimate the effect. And uh, another interesting thing here is that the minimum and the maximum can be different. And this will be the bound. Right, so, none of, so the answer, if the answer is not identifiable, at least in the end you have a bound, which is not necessarily so bad. Sometimes this is enough for a lot of things. And uh, you see that uh, to estimate the effect, I can choose the, the estimate, the, 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 the model that was fit for the minimum or the model that was fit for the maximum 
doesn't matter because they all match. They are all matching the effect. So it doesn't matter. I can choose arbitrarily here. And then I can compute the effect by doing the, mani the manipulation of the model. Because remember when I said that if you have the model, you have everything. And if you, so basically I can just get this model, replace the line, the, the expression for X to be the constant. And then I compute the value of Y given the model. And it uh, doesn't matter if this is just one model of the, if we, we call it equivalence class because all this class of models are equivalent. So it doesn't matter what's the model, we'll get the correct answer, right? So that's another theorem here that says that key, Q, the query is identifiable if and only if they match. So this is a complete algorithm. So they could prove completeness, which means that uh, if the algorithm returns fail, is because it's indeed there that exists is one model of this equivalence class where uh, the effect is, 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 is confounded, which means that the effect cannot be identifiable. Uh, and uh, as a corollary here, uh, we can uh, compute uh, uh, the, the effect just by doing this mutilation. We call it mutilation, but it's that manipulation of the expression for X where we're just replaced by a constant. And uh, that's it, that, that's the neurocausal model. It's really simple, the idea, and it's really clever because basically you can just induce the knowledge that we know that's necessary to be there. And uh, if the, the causal effect is, is matching, this is the, the definition of identifiability. The identifiability actually means that uh, you, you can identify the effect only if this is, if, if you're identifying a causal effect for a causal diagram, for example, this means that the effect is the same regardless of the function, the, the parametric functions that you have for the function or the distributions of the variables. So it's a coarser way of representing the system. You don't need the system, but when you have identifiability, this effect works regardless of all the parametric assumptions. And here is, this, is leveraging this idea because if you have a way of getting all these models that are possible. So you'll have a way to explore this space of models that are explaining the observation of data. You can just check if they are all matching. If they match, you have identifiability and you can get any member of this mm -hmm. class and get the effect. Uh, I think uh, that's okay. Yes. You can ask. Is given so as input. Sure. So just by looking at the double diagram, you can already know what is identifiable. Why do you need to follow this the procedure of the DPDRB that Because uh, because this is a new way of uh, leveraging the the, the 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 capability of neural networks. You could use the approach. Both both approaches work. Right, you can have the causal diagram. You can run the ID algorithm. You can run the uh, estimator that we write everything in terms of uh, uh, of vector adjustment, and then they'll have the whole pipeline. This is just a new way of connecting your deep neural networks, and this gives some uh, new opportunities because now uh, uh, estimators is something that that's really hard to have, like good properties, good estimator properties. And here you are leveraging this universal approximation of deep neural networks to have a good estimator or it is scalability. So it's it's a new vision, uh, but uh, it, it's solving the same problem. <laughs> generate the new data, right? If you, because the neural networks are reproducing the SCM, they are post the social equation. Right. So you can do something that you could not do otherwise, which is easy to generate. Yeah, since, since the model that you that you train is not necessarily the true model, not necessarily you're going to generate the data that, that that's the truth, is going to, yeah, you don't have this this uh, this certain like uh, you, you only have the the certain about the causal effect, so you can generate data to compute the causal effect, but you cannot just gen just generate data and assume that this is coming from the same model that's the reality. It's not they, they don't match. Yeah, you yeah. cannot use it. You can simulate. The you don't simulate the reality. You simulate the same observational data. So the properties of the observational data you can reproduce, but you can actually generate something completely different because it's a different model. It's another model from the equivalence class. 
that, that has the same properties of the observation for the observation of distribution, but they have completely different explanations. So if you generate this data, you can get like completely crazy outcomes that doesn't match with the realities. Like, but it, it, it has the properties necessary to match the observation distribution. And also in this case, if they are matching at least for this specific query, that's why the query is, is, is giving us input. The, the, the only work for this particular, of course, you can have an optimization for several uh, arrows in the graph. You can even have like for all of them. If they are all of them identifiable, then this means that the, the model is identifiable. But what's, this is harder, right? But you can try to add uh, more optimization functions here and, and, and explain more. I also have a question. 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 So this is sort of a theoretical algorithm, right? In the sense that you assume that there are infinite data, mm -hmm. essentially the same. Right? And that you solve the argument in large marks. So in general, with finite data and with approximate solutions, you will always have e of y different from the Right, you need a test. You need a test. You need a test. Right now we are we are just looking if they are closer. <laughs> so this is this is this is new, right? So they I, I have the experiments here. I, I'm going to show you. Okay. Um so that's what they did. Like uh this is Kevin's uh and Kaizen's and uh, in, uh all the co-authors. So we have experiments for all these graphs, so we have eight graphs here. And then they run uh, the neural causal model. So for these four first graphs, they are all the effect of X on Y are all identifiable. We know, right? I just showed you exactly the same graphs before: the back door, front door, M graph, napkin. So they, we know that the effects of, on these graphs are identifiable. And then we run the, the neural causal model. And then this is what we have: like after three thousand uh, training epochs. We will see that the 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 algorithm actually says that the uh, that the, it, this is this is the the the, the percent of, of time that they, they get the, the 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 effect correct, and uh, it says that the effect is ID. So okay, so the, the the distribution are matching, matching is just close enough, close enough, and the uh, over over these 3,000 epochs, it's going to increase this probability of getting it right. And uh, for like after 3,000, almost always it gets uh, correct. Um, we have this uh, hypothesis test uh, to change, to check if they are different or not. So there is this for blue is 001, for green is 003 and red is 005. So it's, the difference is using this test. Um, so for all these four, they get it right uh, after some uh, epochs. For the no identifiable uh, case, it's since the beginning because it's it's funny because it's just that they are different since the beginning. So it's since the beginning you get it right, but even like after three thousand epochs, it's keeping uh, saying that's that's is still uh, different. So you cannot say that the the, the 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 minimum and the maximum are the same, and so this means that they are not identifiable. And in the um, in the bottom here, we have the difference between the maximum and the minimum. And you see that in the beginning, it's really large the difference, right? Uh, and so this is for uh, uh, bottom. Uh, these are the per percentiles uh, for the differences. So in the beginning, it's really large, but over the three thousand uh, epochs, this converts to zero. So it's really close to zero the difference. For all the identifiable cases, they are converging to zero. And for the non-identifiable cases, the difference is too high. Even at, after 3,000 uh, epochs, the difference is high, and then uh, which means that the effect is not identifiable. Is X, Z, and Y those are variables. But vectors or scales? Uh, just one, one variable. One it's not fair. Yeah. No, it's a, a, a variable. Like you, you have a data set for. Yeah, no, no, no. It's, 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 a real variable. it's a real variable. That's it. Nothing crazy. <laughs> um, right. Uh, we have um, this other experiment. That, that's your question uh, about why we would need something new. <laughs> but yeah, this is comparing uh, the, the KL the, 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 the divergence between the. Uh, 
if you would just the naive model is the one that we just train a model and then we get the, the, the effect, assuming that this is the correct one. Uh, and um, uh, this is in blue. The, the orange is using the NCM and uh, the green. Uh, no, this is the, 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 the KL divergence. So you see that the diver divergence here for some cases is, uh, is, is, is different. So um, uh, yeah, most for this one, for example, there is a, a difference between the KL diver diver uh, divergence. And then the, 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 the bottom part here is about the, uh, the difference between, so it's exactly the causal effect. So th that's the average treatment effect where we compare what's the difference when you uh, have the x equals to one and the x equals to zero. So this is exactly the, the one type, one way of computing an effect. And uh, using the, um, the naive is blue, the NCM is orange and the, the WA, uh, this, is, this is a new version, uh, it's an older version of the, the approach of combining several vector adjustments. And you see that uh, uh, the effect here with green, for some reason, is not working. <laughs> but with the, the, the orange is working. So the difference is going to zero. And these three graphs are also matching. Uh, I, I have to check why this is not working. Some, anyways, but the, 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 green, the, the orange one is actually showing that the, the the difference between the, the true and the estimate, the estimated, uh, estimate, estimated effects are going to zero. Uh, yeah, we need to ask Kevin why this screen is not working. <laughs> All right, uh, any questions up to this point? Is it correct to say that the class of the models learned uh, by NCM are in L2 and are bound, they can never be used for like L3 No, no, you're right. Uh, the paper for counterfactors, L3, you mean counterfactors, right? Yeah, the, the, the paper is now uh, on the RIPS. I don't know if it's going to be published or not, but it's already available on uh, causalai.net website. Uh, they extended the neural causal models to uh, identify the counterfactors. And uh, it's, not, it's not the same. You need something else. And uh, I cannot say exactly what's the difference, but you can check the paper. But yeah, there's the, the approach would be something similar, but it need probably more assumptions. I don't know if they are assuming monotonicity, maybe sometimes binary bar, but you need more assumptions about the model to enforce that this is actually the true model. It's not only matching the query in the true in the level two, it's something more. So that's why it's also not useful generation. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yes. More questions? All right, so uh, transportability is, uh, is related to the task of uh, uh, ex extrapolating a causal effect that you identify one in in environment and you want to know if this is going to work in another different environment. Um, so we start always with the lab. This lab is, stands for any environment, population, domain settings, just a place that you collected the data or you, you, you could control, you could run a control, uh, a randomized control trial or it's lab, it's some, just something controlled. And we have the graph for, to explain this environment. And um, uh, the naive way of, uh, of extrapolating the causal effect is assuming that all the functions are the same, which means that uh, the, uh, the, the function for the variable x in the lab, the, the function that generates the variable x in the lab is exactly the same as the function that generates uh, the, the variable x in the, I, I'm using this star here to denote the, the, the new environment that I'm calling here real world. Uh, so if you assume that all functions are exactly the same, uh, this is naive, but yeah, everything is transportable. There's, there's nothing to do. However, uh, so that's what I'm saying. Everything is assumed to be the same, trivially transportable. And the other spectrum, uh, we would say that we don't have, no, we have no knowledge about the, the, the functions. I don't know how is this environment uh, related to the lab. And then everything could be different. 
Uh, and then uh, we denote this, this difference by using this uh, square uh, arrows pointing to the variable. This actually create, it's, it's like having a new variable to explain the differences between the two environments. So it's like if exists a new variable here that's going to model the disparities between the environments. Um, uh, also, uh, I'm not explaining here, but th this is uh, th this is an overlapping between the two environments. So the, the graphs can be different just uh, 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 in terms of existing or not arrows, but we are assuming that the, the directions of the arrows don't change. So for example, one environment could have that X is affecting M, another environment could say that the, the X is not affecting M, which means that the function of M is changing. It's different because one is assuming that's using X, the other is assuming that's not, so the, the functions are different. So I would add this bidirected, uh, this is square arrow pointing to M. And I want to, to have the uh, weakest assumptions, which means that I will have the arrow. Even if in one variable, one environment, I don't have the arrow and the other environment, I have the arrow, I will add the, the arrow because it could be zero, right? It's, it, it's, it's still parameterizing the, the space of possibilities. So it, it, it is the overlapping of all diagrams across all these environments. And every time that these functions are different, I'm going to add this square node pointing to the variable. And the, the, as I said, the other, uh, uh, the, the other side of the spectrum, we just say that everything could be different. And in this case, it's a nightmare because nothing is transported. If this is the case, you, you just can, cannot say anything about it. However, this is not uh, what we believe that the reality is. If you are working on a controlled environment and then you want to transport to another environment, it's because you believe that the other environment is a little bit closer to what you train. Like it's completely different. There's no reason to transport this specific experiment or to this specific cause or effect. And you need to understand the disparities. Unfortunately, we cannot guess. We need this knowledge. And this knowledge will be encoded as uh, a few square arrows, not all of them. So let's see some examples. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, first, we, let's see the workflow. The workflow is exactly as you saw for identifiability, but instead of assuming that you have a causal diagram here, we assume that you have these objects that, that's called selection diagram, but it's just this overlapping of all the causal diagrams with the square, square nodes. But it, the point is, it's representing, uh, representing all my assumptions, my entire knowledge about not only the system, but the difference between the environment. So you need to be uh, clear or transparent in the way that you are going to encode these assumptions. That's, that's the, the, the idea of having this causal diagram. And in this particular example here, uh, we will have a positive answer. So even if you have a a difference in the, 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 the function or even the distribution of X, the, the, the function distribution of FM, as long as you don't have the, the disparities here, the Y in this example, you can transport and you have a formula. And this formula doesn't work for all graphs, like it depends on the graph, of course. But the idea is that it's going to use the available distributions. And note here that the distribution that I'm requiring in this example is that I have observational distribution from, from the target domain. I still need some observations from the target domain, but it's observational. And you have experimental uh, uh, intervention or interventional distribution here in the uh, source domain, could be any source domain, but you, you could have uh, you could perform the intervention, or at least you could identify the effect in this environment. And uh, you could have the, uh, you can compute this, this interventional distribution in some way. And also you have available observational data in the target domain. And this is what I'm using here. So I'm using the observational distribution in the target domain here. I'm using the interventional distribution in the source in this other term. And this is sufficient to actually compute the interventional distribution in the target domain. When we say that this happens is, is when the effect is transportable. Okay. So the question is the question of 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 the question
yeah, the, the distribution of the exogenous variables can be changing and the, the parents can also change. But remember, you also have the overlapping of the diagrams to be able to, to actually uh, uh, account for this possibility of having the parents. Or even like the, the function is different, like the form of the function. In one case is linear, the other is not linear. Could be anything. All right. Um, so uh, there are cases that the, the effect is not, not transportable. This is one example. Like everything is equal except for the y. Uh, and then this is one example where there's no way of using the available distributions to uh, compute the target domain. One, one way of understanding what is happening, this is the, the simplest one. It's not always this case, but the point is like that is, we need to compute the, 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 the distribution of y. That's our query. And if there is a, a, a variable changing here, there is no way of blocking this, uh, this, this disparity. When we have a, 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 the square node in another variable, you can always condition on a variable, block the disparity, and in the end, this will be uh, homogeneous. So, so you, it's in, the, the, the disparity is independent. So uh, basically, if, if it's pointing directly to Y, there is no way of blocking this mechanism here. It's not possible. Um, um, and as I said, this is sensitive to the, cause, the, the causal assumptions. Uh, so imagine, for example, that you have, uh, uh, you could run an experiment that, uh, that, that's verifying the product recommendation of, a, of a, uh, so this is variable Y, and uh, you want to see uh, the, the effect on the click-through rate. Uh, and this was done in the US. However, uh, if you want to transport this to here, to Portugal, uh, maybe uh, if Z is age, maybe the, the, the distribution of the age here in, the, in Europe is different in the US. So the Z here is, is different between US and Portugal. So I have this uh, square, square node pointing to Z. And if it, this is the graph, so uh, it could have, even have a bidirected error here. So this means that it's not identifiable in the target domain. Uh, but it, you have available the distribution, the iterational distribution in the source array. So the, the effect in the target domain, you'll be the effect in the US, that's the one that you have here in the source, and the re -rate, you have to, to do this re-rating uh, using the probability of Z in the target domain. So this is the way of doing correctly if this is the causal diagram. Uh, now let's see another a different scenario. Now I don't have access uh, to uh, age here. So suppose now W is the age and I have access to another variable Z that's called impuls impulsivity. So suppose that uh, in the US people are actually trying to buy a lot of products here. We are like more cautious, like we just buy whatever it's needed. Uh, so anyways, the function of Z is different. And then uh, Z, you see, Z is a proxy of the age, like maybe even also uh, young people are more impulsive. So it depends on age. And this is the only thing that we observe. And if this is the case, uh, the effect is the same. You don't need to re-rate, you don't need anything. It's directly transportable as PY given to X in the source. And if you see here why this is happening is because the disparity here is already blocked. This is a collider. So it doesn't matter if you have a disparity here in the Z, this flow of disparity is not going to Y and uh, that's why the, the, the effect is exactly the same. Uh, another example could be that the Z is this purchase uh, intention. So uh, the product recommendation changes our intention of buying the product. And that's what's changing actually between the US and Portugal, suppose. Uh, uh, I don't know, maybe this is, um, uh, well, I don't know how to explain, but maybe that, that's the intention. People here are not actually trying to buy, so maybe it's a product that's not from, from here, it's a pro pro product from the US, so people are more exposed to this pro product. So the point is that is a difference in the intention. And uh, if this is the case, we have to reweight, but it's a different weight. It's not the same weight as if it was this case here. Uh, so this should be right, but that's the point. Like this is sensitive to the assumptions that you are making the, in the selection diagram. So you, you cannot just blindly just do whatever 
maybe assume that this is going to work. If you are from the uh, potential outcome framework, they usually uh, have this exchange ability uh, assumption uh, over the, 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 the environments. And this means that you are under this scenario here. And this is the expression that they are using to do uh, uh, generalizability. They call it as generalizability generalizability instead of transportability, but they use this reweightening here, but this exchangeability condition that they are assuming is exactly when uh, you are in this scenario where the disparities of the environments are all blocked given the condition, the, the, all the set of covariates that you have. Uh, uh, again, this is a, a, a way of, of making the assumptions more transparent. That's why we need the causal diagram. All right, uh, uh, this is a, a interesting scenario because sometimes we say that they run, if you run a, a, a control, a randomized control trial, you don't need any of this uh, theory. If you have access to the environment and you can run the experiment, you, could, you, you are done. And this is not actually true. Maybe for internal validity, this is true. But uh, suppose that this is the case, like you, uh, before randomization, this is the, the scenario. So you, everything is confounded. And the, the difference between two environments, the variable Z here is different. The function for Z or the, uh, the distribution of Z, they are different between the two scenarios. And then um, uh, after randomization, what happened is actually that all the arrows, uh, all the bidirected arrows here uh, are, are uh, I think you should cut this arrow. Too. So all the arrows in, into, the, into X should be cut. And then uh, you can identify the effect. However, if we're going to transport this to another environment, we need to change, uh, we need to check if this disparity here is, is possible to be blocked. And in this case, it's impossible. Even if you run a trial in the, in the source, and if it, this is the case, you cannot just directly assume that you want to run uh, in the US, it's going to work here in Portugal. Like if, if this is the case, for example, there is no way of blocking because if conditional Z, it's going to open this collider. If you don't block, if you don't conditional Z, that is this path that's open. So there is no way that it's just that uh, you cannot use this data, just throw away and run the, the trial here again. That's that could be the case. Uh, so that's the lesson. Like even if you have a perfect ICE RCP, a randomized control trial, you still need to think to reason about these possibilities to actually see if you can uh, leverage this experimental data in another environment. And uh, we have Fusion for that as well. So you can draw your selection diagram in Fusion and then uh, you can even say what's the distributions that you have available. In this case, for example, I have a distribution in the source. I have observational distribution in the source, or experimental uh, interventional distribution in the source under the DUX and the observational distribution the target. And uh, this is the case that I told you that I can just conditional Z. And this is the transport, transport formula. Uh, could be this one, that's the proxy one, uh, that uh, is exactly the same effect. Uh, or this one, uh, that's uh, another uh, way of getting. For this specific diagram, this is the way of getting the transport, the transport, uh, the transported effect. Uh, more on causal effect transportability, we have uh, also extensions about the soft interventions. As I told you, this, this intervention that I mentioned is just replacing the expression of X as a constant, but you could have different functions. And that there is uh, transportability of soft interventions by Correa and Barry Bar Bar Boyne. Uh, that, that's the paper in 2020. Also counterfactual transportability. Uh, I'm not talking about counterfactual here in this tutorial, but most of these methods, they have their version for counterfactual. So this is counterfactual transportability. This is a really new paper, 2022. Uh, and uh, okay, that's the first, the, the end of the first uh, part, not, not first, first, first part of the section part, the second part. Uh, if, I, if you have questions about transportability, maybe I can take now. No questions? Okay, so uh, there is this question now. Uh, can we relax some of these causal assumptions that we are making the causal diagram? Seems too much, right? This is still too much. You don't require the parametric form. You don't require the distribution. 
But imagine if, if you have like 100 variables, 20 variables is already hard. <laughs> so imagine 1 million, <laughs> right? This big data are really, really hard. So uh, how can we relax these causal assumptions and uh, maybe uh, help the applications? Uh, how can we uh, make it easier to uh, use these tools? Uh, so that's the question. Is a causal diagram still too much? Because uh, Pearl uh, theory in 2000, uh, it was revolutionary because it, it, it requires uh, weaker knowledge in comparison to the structural causal model. Like how can you, don't, the, the causal diagram is already, already a coarsening of a, a structural model, right? So you, do, you, are not, you don't need all the knowledge for, for to specify the, the, the structural causal model and you, you can now do causal inference. But uh, imagine that you, you still need uh, to specify the, the structural knowledge. It's no longer a functional uh, knowledge, but it's a structural knowledge, knowledge for every pair of variables. And well, what can I do if I don't have it available? So is it possible to relax this assumption of having a fully specified causal diagram and still be able to identify a causal effect? So that's the question. Um, so that's that, and then, then this means that we are going to change this input to here of our pipeline. We want to relax this second input here. All right, uh, so that, that's an example in the medical domain. Uh, suppose that uh, you have a few variables already, it's hard. So suppose that you have A, B, C, D here, age, blood pressure, comorbidities, medication history, some variables that we believe that are important to understand this effect of this lisinopril is just a medication uh, to treat hypertension and Y is a variable for stroke. So our interest is to understand what's the effect of this medication on, on a stroke. And then uh, we know that this affects sleep quality. So this is new. Uh, it's, it's even understood that this, this is not confounded anyways. But the point is we don't know the relationship between all these covariates. It's, I don't know. And it's actually not, not actually important. I don't really want, I want just the effect of X and Y. I don't really to learn or to specify all those relationships among, among all these variables that I know that are important, but I, it's not my interest to understand how they are related to each other. Uh, uh, so right now, uh, right now up to this point, a uh, causal diagram cannot be specified. And then uh, the question is, how can we identify the PY given the X just given this knowledge? Okay, so uh, we introduced now this new model. It's called cluster DEX. And the idea, uh, it's a question. No. And the idea is, is pretty simple that uh, basically you uh, going to have a partition of your set of variables where you can, instead of specify the relationships between all the pairs of variables, you need to specify now the relationship between these clusters of variables. And uh, suppose that this is the example. And then uh, now we have clusters. So C are our nodes in this graph. They are clusters of variables. And we will, we will add a ver uh, an arrow from a cluster I to another cluster J. If there exists at least one variable in the cluster that could be a cause of another variable in the cluster J. So if I have, for example, a variable VI in, CJ, in CI that causes Right, that is this parental relationship. Another variable VJ in the cluster CJ. Then I'm going to add an arrow from the cluster to the other. For example, X is a cluster with one only one variable in this case. Uh, the same for S and Y. But in the in the case, I can actually now draw a, a, an arrow from an entire cluster to a variable that's in this case is another cluster. Uh, and uh, suppose that this is the case that I, I don't know which variable is affecting X, I don't know which variable is affecting Y, can be the same, can be the all different, but that, that is some, I believe that there is some variable there. Uh, and uh, uh, maybe it's good to explain here, the assumptions is always about removing verb, uh, arrows. So even if there's no variable here that's a cause of X, if I add the, the arrow, it's fine because it can be zero later. It's, the problem is like when you remove the arrow when it should be there. So uh, if I just 
I, I, I believe there is a potential cause here. I can add this arrow from the cluster to another. And the bidirected arrow has the same meaning. If at least one variable in the cluster is, is, is uh, uh, connected by a bidirected arrow to another variable in another cluster, then I have to connect those with bidirected arrows. For example, this could be uh, the case. Uh, again, we are still under the framework of a cyclic model, so we need to assume that there is no cycles between the clusters. Um, and then uh, I, I want you to under, uh, understand now that this is a new type of equivalence class because a graph is equivalence class of several models, right? So we are encoding many, many possible models where you can just change arbitrarily the, the functions and the distributions. Here, uh, since I'm not specifying the relationship between, relationships between some variables, I'm actually uh, parameterizing a, a, a larger space where many, many diagrams are now encoded. Like for example, this one where, so as I said, like it's just one variable here has to be by, uh, connected uh, by those types of arrows. So this is one example, like A is connected to X, this is connected to Y, like just randomly connecting the variables following this topology. But there are many, many examples, right? So this is an equivalence class. So I'm working on a class now, a class of graphs. That's the idea. Uh, so we can see this as equivalence class of causal diagrams where any relationships are now allowed among the variables within each cluster, right? All right, so uh, the question is, how can we infer causal effects without deciding on any one of particular, well, any particular causal diagram here? So how can we reason on top of a class of diagrams? Uh, so uh, we would change the engine by now just replacing the diagram. Looks easy, but actually I had to uh, extend the whole pipeline when about now this works. So that is like this paper, uh, causal effect identification in cluster DEX, where you can now just describe relationships among clusters. I think this is a good relax, uh, relaxation of the assumptions. Of course, uh, you are not encoding so much as knowledge as before. So the solution here in this case is yes, but could be it's more likely to be a negative answer, of course, in comparison to if, if you are specifying the full causal diagram. But you can do as before, like you can, also, you can just specify this cluster diagram and see if the distributions available can, uh, uh, if you can write the, the expression, an expression of the interventional distribution only in terms of the observation or any distribution that you have up with it. Uh, what is identifiability in this case? Um, identifiability in this case means that uh, if I have an effect that's identifiable from a causal diagram, which means that doesn't matter what's the relationships that are between the variables in the clusters, as long as they are compatible with the knowledge encoded, the, the effect will be the same, exactly the same in all of them. Uh, and I can use the same expression as before. I can compute, uh, I, I don't need to understand the relationship between the variables. I can compute as it is, and then I will get the right effect. So that's the meaning of identifiability from this class. Um, uh, what is no identifiability? No identifiability means that that exists at least one in the class that the effect is not identifiable. It is possible that if you had the knowledge to specify all the, 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 the fully specified the causal diagram, this would be identifiable, but you don't have the knowledge. So you cannot uh, make the assumption that the, 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 the effect is actually uh, identifiable. It could be this one. You are allowing for this possibility. So basically you don't have the knowledge to identify the effect. That's the, the meaning of no identifiability from this class. Um, and uh, this uh, this is really related to this conditional ignorability assumption because in the potential outcome infer from this uh, framework, usually we do this conditional ignorability assumption and then we consider a whole cluster of covariates saying that this variable, the set of variables are blocking the backdoor paths, if you remember. Uh, so this is this is a cluster, but it, it's, it wasn't clear up to this point what actually this means. And the, what this means is actually that uh, uh, 
you are assuming that the cluster DAG, when you, you, you are assuming that in the cluster DAG, the set, uh, the, the cluster Z are blocking all the vector paths. And this framework, framework the, 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 this model, this new model is now allowing you to go beyond the vector adjustment uh, or to go beyond the condition equality because now you can you still have clusters, which is appreciated in the, in the applied side, uh, but you can now uh, add more information by leveraging clusters. And then, for example, this is our, uh, it's, it's again missing here the prime, <laughs> uh, but uh, this is the uh, front door adjustment, uh, where, uh, which means that uh, for any model that, uh, that, that could be, uh, that, that it is in this class, we can, we can use the same formula and this will be correct. You can even know here that, for example, here, there is no direct, uh, the M1 and M2 are in the cluster uh, mediator and they are not really connected. They are not really a mediator, like they are disconnected here, if you look here. But the formula still works because the assumptions are in the independencies. So it's okay, like as long as, as, long as it's working uh, in the class is going to work on, uh, any, even if you have a, a, a stronger uh, graph where you have more independences. So that's, that's the, the idea. Uh, so in this case, all the, the, the diagrams you have, you, you can identify the effect from, from the, if you identify the effect from the class, all these graphs you have uh, the effect identifiable by using the same formula. Uh, so, CDEG actually, is, so CDEG is uh, just a, a name for cluster DEX, is a flexible encoder of this model assumptions, right? So we could start, we, you could, if you have knowledge to create clusters of one variable is the same as you had before. You can now have partial knowledge. And uh, if you have no knowledge, it's the same as putting everything in the same cluster. And then of course you have nothing. <laughs> Uh, but the, right now, clusters are manually created by domain experts, so we still need this specification between clusters, so we still require knowledge. And uh, the, the clusters are created due to this lack of knowledge, but could be other, like, like this could be interesting other situations. For example, sometimes you have two experts and one believes that the cause is like one direction, other expert believes that they're causing another direction. So this is an uncertainty about the, the system. So, so you can uh, deal with both. Like, let's see if that is uh, a cause or effect that agrees with the consensus in the other uh, uh, part of the, the graph. Um, or sometimes it's just burdensome. Like, I don't want to specify the whole thing. I, can, I want to, to try first, if I can get the effect, just specifying uh, some clusters. And if it's not, I can try to specify a little bit more and so on. So it could be a little bit more adaptive. And uh, if, uh, you can also try to create clusters that, that express some meaning. Sometimes you really want to, for example, you have a cluster that, that, that's just about uh, um, like images and then the other cluster that's about uh, sounds and all that. So sometimes you can cluster things that are related. So in the end, when you are going to try to, inter to get explainability about this model, it's easier instead of how can I communicate different modalities? Maybe it's interesting to have these clusters also to communicate uh, uh, the relationships. Um, I, I think this is obvious, but I want you to show different graphs. So if, if this is the, the causal diagram, suppose, and the effect is identifiable from the fully specified causal diagram, depending on the way that you are clustering the variables, you can have different formulas and sometimes you can even have no identifiability, of course. So this is just new graphs, right? So you'll be sensitive to, to the way that you are constructing the graphs. All right. Um, another uh, possibility to relax this assumption is about, um, is about learning from data, right? So we have data. So uh, we really need to use our prior knowledge to construct this, this diagram, or can we try to extract from data some some signatures that, that, that are going to allow us to construct this causal diagram. And uh, it is uh, possible, so that's the question, right? So if you, we don't have knowledge available to construct living a cluster diagram, can we learn a causal diagram from observational data? 
And uh, yes, um, so uh, in non-parametric settings, we have this, uh, uh, sorry, in non-parametric settings, we, as you know, we cannot learn the true causal diagram. Of course, uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this is a consequence of the, the Perl's causal hierarchy. You cannot just from data learn the causal diagram. You cannot move from layer one to layer two. Uh, so you cannot learn the true system, the whole system, but you can learn some parts. And the, when you learn some parts, which means is that uh, you are uh, learning a class because you allow that the parts that you couldn't learn to be one direction or another or uh, no relationship, whatever. You, you are going to consider many, many models that are compatible with this uh, data. And this class is called Barkov equivalence class. It's the class where the models are equivalent in the sense of uh, condition independence, because the condition independence is the only thing that you can learn from data. So they all are equivalent in the sense that they all encode the same set of condition independences observed in the data. Uh, so that is this actually this uh, relationship between this separation and condition independence that I already mentioned, that's called global Bar Markov proper that says that everything that you read from the graph is going to be observed in the, the distribution. So a separation, a disseparation between two variables giving another variable, giving two sets of variables, giving an, a third set of variables actually implies an independence in the probability distribution. Uh, but for learning, we need to require the reverse now of this implication. So we need to uh, assume something that's called faithfulness which means that we, what we observe in data is actually uh, uh, associated to a separation in the graph. So it's just the reverse because we are going to learn from data. And uh, uh, in this case, just remember that the, this, this is for Bayesian networks. So we always have the chain rule uh, to factorize the probability distribution. So I have the use here. So this is a little bit different from uh, Bayesian networks. But we have a factorization over the graph. And uh, given the independences between uh, uh, the variables, so we have, so this, this works as the chain rule that this holds for any topological order. But uh, uh, when you have some uh, independences, you, you can actually factorize the joint, joint distribution by saying that the variable is independent of all the non descendants given the parents and the variables u. So this is going to simplify the factorization of the joint distribution. And this factorization is actually, is, is actually following the topology of the causal diagram. So this is just a characterization what the, the causal diagram means. And uh, this is going to be leveraging this causal structure learning algorithm. So we have some algorithms that can use data and that's, that's, that's the pipeline. So again, the causal model is unknown but it, it induces the data. And the data can be used to uh, learn the observation distribution. So I'm, I'm, I'm listing here some conditional, in this case, it's a marginal independence, but you, you, can, you can list all independences that are observing the data, conditional or marginal independences. You have dependencies as well, but we are going to encode independences. That's the goal. There is an algorithm called FCI, that's fast causal inference. That's the, uh, the reference by uh, Gigi Zeng. Gigi Zeng. Uh, and uh, basically it is going to use this condition independences observed in the data. Uh, there's a set of orientation rules. Uh, how can I? There's a set of orientation rules. Okay, wait. Sorry, uh, it's just to hide that part. Yeah, okay. So, uh, the FCI is going to use these independences and then co you combine a set of orientation rules. And in the end, you can learn a, some piece of the graph. In this case here, uh, we have only the information that X is independent of Y. And uh, let's try to just uh, use this as an example. You can factorize the join using the chain rule. So this is just for any topological order that I, that I choose, I can factorize in this way. And then using the independence of X and Y, I can replace one of the terms with, in this case, X is independent of Y. So this is equivalent 
is, is equal to probability of x because x is dependent of y. So I just use now this to simplify the factorization. And now that's the only way if I, if I choose any topological order, I will always come to the same output in this case. And because of that, I can say that uh, I, can, I can use this to, uh, to, to, to uh, show that the variables are uh, following the, the, the parental relationship. So Z here, uh, is going to be uh, there is an arrowhead from x and y. It's following this order here. X doesn't depend on, on anything, so there's nothing here, and y does, doesn't depend on anything. That's why there's no arrow here. But you see here that there is the circles, and the circles means that the the there are some members of this equivalence class where this uh, the uh, the the edge could be an arrow. The, the edge mark here could be a narrow head, could be a tail, could be both, because we have bidirected, we can have direct at the same time. So it's just that uh, there is no um, uh, consistency, that this is not an invariance in the, in the whole class, so I cannot learn. Uh, and that in, in the case that we have this, we are not assuming that uh, we are allowing for these unmeasured confounders, this class actually, uh, is, is uh, it's called partial ancestral graph because it's re representing ancestral relationships, not uh, direct uh, parental uh, relationships. So for example, when I have a, 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 this arrow here, so I have an arrow head first that says that, uh, no, sorry, I have a tail here first that says that A is ancestral of B and the arrow head means that the B B is not an ancestor of A. So this is now in terms of ancestral relationships. Uh, a circle here says that A has an unknown relationship uh, with B, but B at least is a known ancestor of A. If I have arrowhead in both ends, means that A is not an ancestor of B and B is not an ancestor of A. And if I have like an undirected arrow, this algorithm is able to detect selection bias which means that A and B are just connected because they are pointing to the same effect. And this is effect is being conditioned on, like you, you are selecting, uh, you are observing under some specific condition. That's exactly what uh, this variable is modeling. Um, uh, so this algorithm is able to reconstruct this object called partial ancestral graph that sometimes we call it SPAG, P-A-G, PAG. And, uh, as I said, this represents many, many models. So those are just a few examples, not all of them. But that's what I mean. Like the arrowheads are always uh, in Z. So you could have even more than that, but it's always arrowheads pointing to Z. This is an invariance, but you don't know what's happening in the other end of the, 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 the arrows. Could they are circles? This means that could be tail, could be both. Could be something just connected by a bidirected arrow, as in this case. Could be everything. Could be just that. So there are many, many possibilities. But at least you could learn that they are pointing to it. It's an invariance. Uh, this is another example. I'm going a little bit faster in this case. Uh, but this is a case where you can only learn that x is independent of y given z in the distribution, and this is going to be reflected as x separated of this separated of y given z. So I know that z here is a known collider. So although that is only circle here, that is information, that means that z is a known collider, cannot be a collider, but I cannot orient anything. And this is because like could be many, many possibilities. Like if I try to factorize and use this independence, I can come up with many, many, many models. But the class is representing all of them. And that's important to know that all, that's the only information that I can uh, extract from data. And, uh, okay, uh, that's the question. Uh, so now that uh, we understand, uh, okay, now let me just show a few examples. So this is the example where I can learn the cause of the, uh, a collider. This is another example that's where Z is a known collider but this could be a chain, could be a fork, could be many things. Uh, this is another example that's interesting that uh, I cannot learn the left part here, but uh, this is green because uh, if that is a concept that's called visibility, which means that all 
members of this equivalence class has that X is pointing to Y and this is not confounded. So it's something more than just directionality. So X is ancestor of Y because this is a partial ancestor graph, but there is something that I can detect that's about there is no confounder, a measured confounder between X and Y. Uh, to be more precise, there is no inducing path, it's a, a specific term, but it, when special cases are confirmed. But when you have this induced path, inducing path means that you cannot uh, control for that and get the, the, the causal effect. So this concept of visibility is really important because they are the only arrows that I can actually compute the causal effect. And this is a graph where I cannot know what is happening in this left side, but I can actually infer the effect of X on Y just using data. So this is awesome because I'm not using any knowledge in this case. This is another example uh, where sometimes I can detect spurious, completely spurious associations. Um, and then uh, this is another interesting one because it's, it's, not, it's not so trivial to translate a peg to a, a, a causal diagram. So you see Z here is ancestor of Y. That's the, the, the meaning of a peg. But the ancestrality is through Z in this particular causal diagram. And uh, this arrow is not visible. So it's not green here. So the X to Y is visible, but the Z to Y is not visible because there are some members in the equivalence class where their relationship is confounded. Even though like this is directed, Z is not, a, I can, Z is just ancestor of Y. And uh, in this case, I cannot compute the effect from Z to Y because there are some cases that are, that are confounded. All right, so uh, uh, as you may notice, it's like you need to learn condition independences from the data and uh, you need a condition independence test. So there are a few uh, available. So the most, uh, the classical one is when you have Gaussian arrows, independent observations, this is a partial correlation test. We have a packaging R for that. Uh, even develop one partial correlation test uh, for Gaussian arrows, but when you have family data, anyways, you can develop your own. Uh, uh, there is this paper that uh, uh, allows you to use kernel methods, so uh, you can have now no parametric tests uh, for uh, testing condition independences and applying to causal discovery, and that there are many, many others. Uh, that is this package here, uh, Condin tests that has many, many independence tests there. You can just cho choose uh, the one that's appropriate for you. And uh, uh, now we did the same, like, like I, I extended, uh, this is a paper uh, with uh, Jabber, Gigi uh, Zeng and Barry Roy. We extended the framework to now as, uh, instead of assuming that they have the causal diagram, you, can, you now have a way of doing inference by just including the pack. So now there's no knowledge here that you can re, that you can uh, that you that you that you are required to add. Uh, of course, this is weaker than having the causal diagram. So this is is probably uh, have many more cases where there is a negative uh, answer. But there are cases where we can have a positive answer, and this is one. Uh, where the effect of X on Y, I can know that Z here is blocking the vector path. Uh, so this is the adjustment. So I, I could learn from data that this is a case that's the backdoor and uh, the effect is identifiable by the, by the adjustment, as you know. Um, so what exactly means identifiability? It means that uh, for all graphs in the equivalence, that's a little bit repetitive, but it's important to emphasize that this is relaxing the assumption because it, it works for all the members. And this idea is, is important. Like once you have the, uh, the formula for the class, doesn't matter what's happening uh, with, uh, in, in, in between the, the variables you have, you, you, you work. Uh, and no identifiability actually means that the, at least one member of the equivalence class where the, the, the effect is not identifiable. I, I'm concluding. <laughs> um, so the conclusion here is uh, that uh, Causal inference can help overcome, overcome critical challenges in artificial intelligence, including robustness, generalizability, explainability, and fairness. And uh, this is a new field that's called, uh, we are calling as causal data science, causal artificial intelligence. But the, the idea is to develop uh, principal methods. Uh, it's a principal way of 
first combining the data that you have. You need to understand all these dimensions that are have all, all these uh, disparities that you have between uh, environments, the way that you collect the data. So first that, then how can I combine with any prior knowledge that you have and then have a transparent way to encode everything that you have available and then generate, use this to generate causal explanations and better decision-making. Um, uh, well, this is uh, just a, a nice sentence. Recent development, developments for causal inference when knowledge is largely unavailable in course are expected to help the threats of causal data analysis and meet the growing demand that they appear concise for some causal explanations and more robust and general, generalizable decision-making. So this is uh, more about the idea of relaxing the assumptions and now bridging this gap between uh, theory and press. Uh, we have many other topics that I didn't cover here, but I, I'm putting some pointers for you. So I discussed in this tutorial uh, more about causal inference, generalizability, and transportability. So the, the first two bullets here. So you can check um, uh, all these tools in the, in the web app. The web app. Also, all the papers are available. This is the web page from the Causal AI Lab. But we have a lot of discussions about fairness that you can check in this website. And if you are, you are also interested in the intersection between reinforcement learning and causality or in the design of experiments in the case you have a negative uh, answer, you can check uh, the crl.causalai.net website. All right, uh, questions? <laughs> There's one here. Yeah. Could you maybe provide an example or some like maybe an observational data? You may be providing an example where previously somebody used observational data and now they use like to think of the causal graph and were able to show through the robustness at the moment. Well, uh, well, the paper about uh, I, uh, learning a peg, for example, and identify the causal effect is uh, under review right now, and we have some experiments there. Uh, so I don't have any uh, real data application showing that. But uh, uh, improving robustness is some, something that's certain. Like if you, if you're, uh, of course, there's always assumptions here in, in, in the process, for example, learning a graph. It's it's not so trivial because you depend on you you're depending on this on the real uh, on the condition dependence test being reliable uh, on uh, you don't make any mistakes on data being safe there are some assumptions here so of course if those assumptions are being violated the robustness is well, depends on that but uh, there's it's clear here what are the assumptions. It's, that, that you are making or so everything that you're relying and then uh, you'll be more robust than if you are not following the procedure. This. What time, what, the first time you showed the green value? For the FCI? Yes, The second graph is this one. See the same in Markov, it doesn't plug to reverse the first one. Yes, exactly. Okay. And the one below, no, third graph. This one? No, no, third. No, 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 one back. This one? Right? It would be the same if you take A, W, and C and put them all in one variable. In the, in the A, W, and C, yes. And put them all in one variable, which is the, the all right. product of all. Yes. 
And in that case, that graph becomes equivalent to the one above, where instead of this X, you have a dozen Z. You're talking about putting a cluster over W, A, and Z, right? Yes, that's true. It'll be exactly the same as this one, and then you wouldn't learn this one. So in that case, what, what, is it, what, what happens, what's different from the second to the third that makes the right arrow visible and not? That independence here. The dependence between W and Z given A. But if there was an arrow from A to X, then you would get. You, so H to X, uh, no. So H to X, you still have it because it's that arrow from W and Z that's not here. So it's the independence between W and Z given A. So there's no arrow here. This is used to learn this collider because when you can, so you can check this is the collider test. But it's, how does that affect the visibility of the arrow? The visibility is, is the independence between W and Y given X. You, the visibility is given when you have an arrow that's pointing to X. So first you need to learn this arrow head here. And then you need that the variable that's pointing to X is independent of Y given X, which is the case. So you are, you are using the fact that you could learn the order that W is coming before the X. So it's not X pointing to W. So the fact that X is a known assessor of Y plus the fact that W is not not connected to W, W is not connected to Y given X. They're both things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah if you add an arrow here, you lose that. And also if you yeah. add an arrow here, you lose that. Well, as I said, like the, the assumptions are in the missing arrows. Yeah. <laughs> That's important. That's not. And then try on let's say if we have some thoughts and we want to. Yeah, uh, applications are really hard. Uh, you can try to learn, like if you create, like learning over clusters is a, a ongoing project. So <laughs> right now you can only learn the, the peg over uh, individual variables. But it, you could try to learn and you see that uh, maybe in the end you have everything connected, this would be the case. If it's not, it's because sometimes you can learn. Uh, um, but that, that's the quest, that, that's, the, the, that's a consequence of you not, that uh, you are not, you are agnostic. Like you, you, don't know, not, you don't know anything about the environment. And if this is the case, you have to consider all the possibilities. And this is this is the problem. The, the idea is to try to gather knowledge in this in, the, in until you get some uh, some way of constraining this space of models and be able to reason more about the the, the, the so that that's not about uh, that's not a, 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 a limitation of the method. It's a limitation of the knowledge. So once you know more about the system, you can try to uh, run the pipeline again. But there are many, many uh, questions that uh, it's a research question, actually. So for example, how can you design a better experiment? Maybe with reinforcement learning in language, I think we can do uh, experiments much easier than, uh, than the, in medical field, for example. So maybe you can design these experiments to uh, go uh, and learn what's missing, and then you have the knowledge. And then you check where you have these confounders, where you don't have it, or maybe observe the confounder that you know that's there um uh yeah <laughs> I, I just uh just to add about causal reinforcement learning this is exactly what they are doing causal reinforcement learning they try to uh learn a model while you are doing exploration and exploitation so it's, it, you actually build the causal diagram while you are doing exploration 
And there's like a, some, there are some papers about where and when you have to intervene. Uh, that that's going to that's related to design of experiments to know uh, to 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 actually get the knowledge that you need and, and convert faster to the answer. Um, hi, okay. um, thanks a lot for the nice talk. Um, it was really inspiring. Um, I have. <laughs> I was looking. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, uh, I had a very generic question. Like it's. It's kind of related to the causal uh, structure uh, inference or a reasoning that uh, you talked about. So in in our scenario uh, in in vision and language and vision and vision question answering, we always have this tendency of you know this biasness like um, in the reasoning, like uh, especially in, in the case of language modality. So um, my question uh, to you would be like, what how to like in during the training phase, like is there a way to use some kind of this this causal uh, reasoning uh, for interpreting like when we get the uh, answer from these kind of language vision language models? So how how what's the right way to design this kind of uh, experiment like in this scenario? Uh, so are you? Uh, question. So your question is about learning. The, the yeah, in the in the, in the learning phase, like, uh, is there a way to interpret like what? Right. Yeah, this this is related to something that's really new. It's called causal representation learning. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it's it's really new. Like, there's 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 only a few methods available, and uh, um, they are using some assumptions that I don't really understand. Uh, so I. For example, this principle of the independent of mechanisms. There are some papers about that, where they they try to uh, learn, but this is it's hard to understand how this is connected to, to the assumptions in the SCM. Uh, but uh, this would be more related to understand how to separate. Uh, I think it's really related to the idea of cluster diagrams as well, or learning yeah. cluster, cluster diagrams, because these diagram these clusters could could have a meaning, but when you are learning at that, so this is about learning a partition. It's not about learning uh, the, the diagram. So what's the best partition? And the, uh, right now there is no method available for that, but I, I'm sure like uh, people will work on that uh, on the next few years. Uh, it's a really interesting problem. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Let's make a delegate.